All right. Uh, terrific. Good morning, everyone. Uh, City Clerk, can you take the roll, please? Alderman Braithwaite. Here. Alderman Wendt. Alderman Wilson. Here. Alderman Ruth Simmons. Alderman Suffordin. Here. Alderman Ravel. Here. Alderman Fleming. And Alderman, Alderman Rainey and Alderman Fleming. All right. And Alderman Fisk. Ter terrific. Thank you. We have, we have quorum. I expect uh, some of the other council members to arrive that aren't here right now. Uh, welcome, everyone, to the Saturday. It's unusual for us to have Saturday, but to the Saturday, October 27th, 2018 meeting. It is a uh, sort of a special meeting because today's meeting is about the Evanston City budget, which we've been talking about for some time and obviously have uh, some real challenges this year that have to be addressed. Uh, the way today's meeting is going to go is we've got two public hearings and then we'll actually go into the meeting, which is uh, several items on the uh, special order of business. So uh, the first one is um, in regards to the 2019 proposed budget for the city of Evanston. Pursuant to the Illinois compiled statutes in sections 1-11-5 of the city code, the Evanston City Council is conducting a public hearing today to consider the fiscal year 2019 proposed budget document. The purpose of this hearing is to allow for the public input into the proposed budget document. I hereby convene the hearing for the fiscal year 2019 proposed budget presentation open. Uh, I'd like to ask the uh, city CFO at this time just to give a short presentation about the budget and the tax levies. Let's do both of those, uh, uh, Hitesh, and then uh, we'll open it up to public comment. And I've got folks that have signed up here. Um, and uh, and if after we've completed that, you haven't signed up and you want to, I'll let you come on up today. Welcome, Hitesh. Uh, good morning, Mayor and the members of the City Council. Uh, I would have a just quick presentation about the budget and the tax levy. Uh, so let's move forward. Uh, this is the budget presentation, just a short summary for the 19 um, and the tax levy for the tax year 2018. Um, and then it talks about the upcoming meetings, Monday night, the city council meeting about the budget, and again on November 12th, uh, Monday, for the budget. Uh, this is the all funds of the 2019 proposed budget, the expenditure. Obviously the general fund, the main fund, uh, carrying at $115 million or 36% of the total budget, and followed by some of the enterprise funds, which are the water, sewer, parking, and uh, This is the 2019 proposed budget, all funds revenue side, and where we are. And this is by the category, some of those one again, general fund at 35% of the total, special revenue funds at around $13 million debt service at $16 million. Capital projects uh, at around $33 million. Uh, this is the general fund, which is the main operating fund for the city, uh, how the revenues look like. Uh, property tax, obviously, is the top item, followed by other taxes, which includes the sales tax, home rule sales tax, income tax, and some of the other taxes. general fund expenditures for the 2019 uh, by each department in the general fund, city council, clerk, administrative services, fire, police, police and fire being the public safety uh, with the highest expenditure of the total general fund. This is the tax levy. This is the tax levy for 2018. The money would come in 2019 for the city of Evanston. So. You look at the general fund, which is kind of called corporate levy, uh, at $9.5 million. I'm at a pension at 1.5. A general assistance fund at 900,000, that levy is remaining flat. And solid waste fund at 820,000, which makes up of $12.7 million for city and general assistance levy. Uh, this is the other part of the pension funds, of the fire pension, police pension fund. Uh, fire pension levy uh, at $7.9 million, so it's going down compared to the last year, whereas the police pension fund is slightly going up by 39000 compared to the 2017 levy. Debt service fund, uh, pay for our bonds issued, principal and interest on our bonds. Uh, we are keeping it flat at $10.8 million. So the total city net levy is $41.7 million. Library, uh, library levy, uh, the $6.7 million for this year, uh, increase of $123,000 compared to the 2017 levy. 
library fund debt service levy, slight increase of $20,000. So the total library net levy is going up by 143000 this year. Special service areas. The city has two special service areas where we levy the taxes right now. Uh, special service area four, uh, the levy is going up by 155000 This is mainly because of the increased DAV. So most likely the rate would remain the same, but just to capture uh, part of the Washington National and some of the maybe the expansion. So, And then the special service area six, the levy is remaining flat at 221000 that's it. Any questions? All right. Seeing no questions, thank, thank you, thank Fish. You. Okay. We're now, we're now going to move into um, the public's comments on the uh, 2019 proposed budget for the c city of Evanston. Um, Let's see. Is this the first one? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I've got uh, folks that have signed up, um, and I'll call off the first three names. And if you guys can just line up um, and make your make your comments, um, as we sort of always say, if somebody else has really sort of made the the key point that you want, you can say, "Hey, I just want to reiterate, uh, I agree with so so and so." Um, I would ask people if we can try to you know keep your comments to three minutes uh, or less. Um, that would be ideal so we can get through everybody that wants to speak. Uh, Susan Davis Friedman is first, then Beth Adley, and then um, Kim, Kimka Harris. I apologize again if I'm mispronouncing names, so welcome. Good morning, Mayor Haggerty, members of the City Council, um, uh, City Manager Bob Kowitz. Um, we are uh, Susan Davis Friedman and Beth Adler. We're the co-chairs of the Evanston Arts Council. Um, in 2012, Evanston named the arts one of six targeted um, business sectors with the potential to drive economic development. Evans Starts, a community-wide outreach project, was launched to frame a strong vision for the arts in Evanston. More than 750 residents representing the city's nine wards helped to bring this vision into focus. The overarching vision developed by this task force states, Evanston is invested in fostering a dynamic, accessible, and culturally rich arts community where creativity flourishes in a welcoming, collaborative environment that encourages lifelong participation in the arts by residents and visitors alike. For the five years that followed, the city of Evanston has funded a cultural arts coordinator who, together with the Arts Council, oversaw program grants and public art investments. The proposed 2019 Evanston city budget eliminates all 175000 in general arts funding. In addition to the loss of the cultural arts coordinator position, the budget eliminates $30,000 in cultural fund grants, $10,000 in community support art fund grants, and $10,000 in administrative costs, which, part, which in part funds civic arts activities and training. In addition, $75,000 in yearly public arts funding has also been eliminated from the capital budget. The City of Evanston and the Evanston Arts Council has a long history of providing funding to local artists and arts organizations, <laughs> making art experiences and programs accessible to all members of our community. This funding is essential to the Evanston Arts community. We hear time and time again that grants from the City of Evanston and the Evanston Arts Council provide important validation for arts organizations. The funding we provide in turn helps these organizations to go out and raise funds from private sources that allow them to continue to have an impact on Evanston residents through their programs. Additionally, we have seen the positive economic impacts of public art beautifying our landscape and theater, music, and dance performances encouraging people from neighboring communities to spend time and money supporting Evanston businesses. A yearly allocation supporting public art has helped to fund 11 murals, four lease sculptures, and one major environmental sculpture at the Green Bay Emerson and Ridge intersection. This sculpture called Stitch, along with the murals that surround it, represent the stitching together of several Evanston communities and provide an exciting entry point into our city where there was once a dark and gloomy corridor. Public art in every ward continues to be an Arts Council priority. We want all our citizens to experience art in their immediate surroundings. We have current public art um, commitments that require completion, including a mural scheduled for spring 2019 and sculptural leases that continue into 2020. We therefore are asking for 25000 in capital funding to meet these budget obligations. 
The Evanston Arts Council respectfully requests the reexamination of arts funding in the 2019 budget. We would like to see the following reinstated for 2019, which represents a 70% reduction in the funding that was allocated in 2018. 30,000 for the cultural art fund grants, 10,000 for the community support arts fund grants, 10,000 in administrative costs, and 25,000 for the neighborhood public art fund. In closing, we know that the arts coordinator position needs to be eliminated at this time. However, we hope that you will consider reinstating funding for this position at a later date so that the City of Evanston and the Evanston Arts Council can have an advocate in making an investment in the city's residents through, it, through its grant making activities. We understand the city council has some difficult decisions to make over the next month. Keeping basic city services and supporting vital youth programs is critical. It's easy to target the arts as unnecessary. We hope that you will look past this assumption and see how the arts are a reflection of a community that cares about its residents and wants to invest in the future. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Thank you, Susan. And thank you for your work on the Arts Council. Uh, next up is uh, Kamika Harris. Kim Kia Harris. Thank you very thank much. You. Good morning, Mayor and members of the City Council. My name is Kim Kia Harris, and I'm an attorney that represents the Illinois Fraternal Order of Police Labor Council. We represent the patrol officers, sergeants, and non sworn police personnel who work for the city. There is more at stake here than just dollars and cents. The bigger issue is the quality of life that the citizens of Everson have come to expect, and an effective police department is a major factor in maintaining that good quality of life. An effective police department is one that responds quickly to calls, has well-trained and motivated officers, and interacts with the community through citizen programs. This keeps the crime rate low and makes residents feel good about living here. That is what we have now in Evanston. But this major factor in Evanston's quality of life is in jeopardy if the cuts that you're discussing are enacted. Not filling vacant positions will lead to longer response times. It may take longer for those police officers to arrive at your house because there might be fewer of them on duty and at any given time. These officers will likely have lower morale and may be more susceptible to burnout because they are working more days and longer hours to make up for the unfulfilled positions. And overworked officers are more likely to be injured on the job, presenting a liability risk for the city. Is cutting the budget in this way worth the human cost and more property damage theft or violence, not to mention the on-the-job injuries that might result from an understaffed and overworked police department. Let's not forget the great relationship the police department has with the community through the Officer and Gentleman Program, the STAR Program for Young Teen Women, ALICE Training, the Citizen Police Academy, and the Explorers Program. Officers want to continue to offer these and other programs that bridge the relationship between the police department and the citizens. How can they keep doing this if officers barely have time to do their regular jobs? We know you face a lot of tough choices as you wrestle with the city's budget. We simply ask that you look down the road to the effects that the budget cuts in the police department will have on your fellow citizens and neighbors. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Kim Kia. <laughs> next, next up, we've got Janad Rizki, Don Ziegler, and then uh, Marquise uh, Weatherspoon. Dad Risky. Um, I think everyone comes here, and I know many people are concerned about their one issue, but the bigger issue is that there's no money left to, to really run anything anymore. The city's bankrupt. Um, of course, uh, bankruptcy, what does bankruptcy really mean? The city's not going to go insolvent. It's not going to go under receivership. It's basically going to mean the taxes are going to go up dramatically. The council doesn't want to do that, but that's where it's headed. 
It's a huge tax increase, and it's basically because of 10 years of, of mismanagement, problems and waste, lawsuits, and issues. I mean, it's pretty clear. I send the council emails every few days. I sent the council an email recently about the lawsuits. Basically, the lawsuits are continuing not beyond this, beyond this budget cycle into 2020, and the, the city's underrepresenting those lawsuits, the amount of money it's costing, and the budget will be in the same problem in 2020 with probably close to a $7 million hole. So um, this is all there, but nobody seems to, to look at it. It's all being hidden, basically by hidden. Nobody wants to talk about it. It's not being clearly conveyed to people. And when I've talked to a council member about a month ago, the council member really didn't understand the cost. And that's really a problem, a lack of communication between this, the management staff here and the council, because the council really doesn't want to know what's going on. And that's the problem. It's a big mess. And everything you look at is mistakes. And you, I, staff has come up to this podium so many times and misrepresented things, which is downright lying. And I mean, just you go to the meeting on Harley Clark, the other citizens are saying they're sitting there, it's just a mess. They're not making any sense. Even the board was saying the city just is making up stuff. And this is what goes on here all the time. And this is why we're in a huge, huge budget problem. And it is going to get worse. So you better decide what you want to do to fix it. I'm not going to even go into all the details. I'm, I guess I get to speak at a few more hearings. So we'll go into more detail. But I'm just warning you, you better fix it because you're going to have to face it. You're going to have to change the city. You're going to have to change the operations. And some of you are going to have to start some different behaviors. Thank you. Thank you, Jeanette. Uh, next up, Don Ziegler, Marquise Weatherspoon, then Sandra Burns. Uh, good morning, Honorable uh, Mayor, members of the, uh, City Council, and City officials. I am Dr. Don Ziegler, resident uh, since 1979, living in the Fourth Ward at 1430 Elmwood. I'm on the faculty of the School of Public Health at UIC, uh, also at Loyola University, and proudly I chair the Evanston Health Advisory Council. The proposed budget cut. Uh, the pro proposed budget cuts five positions in the health department. We're willing to compromise with the council. If you have to, let's cut only two, the vital records and domestic violence uh, positions. Those services can be covered by other um, groups. We've heard that the communicable disease specialist position might be spared. That's great. But we must also save the assistant director and the health educator positions, or there goes our state certification. Certified health departments can and do get hundreds of thousands of dollars of federal and state funds uh, to protect our health, particularly the most vulnerable of our city. Our director is a recognized leader who leverages relationships with stakeholders and manages the entire HHS department. Getting funds and definitely needs the assistant director to manage day-to-day -day operations. The health educator is a critical to conduct our chronic disease programs on obesity, diabetes, heart disease, and cancer. That position manages the essential community needs assessment and five-year plan, or E-plan, required of a certified health department, as well as uh, overseeing numerous unpaid interns. While communicable diseases are important, they are not the only health challenges we face. In inclusion, Work with us, compromise with us, cut two of the five positions, but retain the three most critical for Evanston and our certified health department. Without them, we'll likely increase our health challenges, worsen health inequities, and fail our citizens who depend on services and the leadership of the health department. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Dr. Ziegler. Uh, Marquise Weatherspoon, Sandra Burns, and then Pat Burns. Good morning. I am the president for the Evanston Advocates for Action, which is a community leadership council formed by Cradle to Career. And we were asked by the Equity Commission Council to um, do a it's not too late budget follow-up survey. Um, and that was 
performed because of the response that we got from the original budget survey recognizing that um, most people did not respond to the survey. Most people did not fill out the survey. They were not aware of the survey. So what we did, we hit the streets and we got results from uh, the least informed communities. And they, the, the results were very alarming because they said that they did not participate in the budget survey because they felt like that their voice would not be heard, that they felt like that they would not, that they do not matter in this community. And I feel like once we gave them the tools that they needed to be able to um, be a part of something and they felt like that their voice were was heard and they were able to get information regarding uh, meetings and where they could come and make their voice heard that they were very they were they were much more comfortable with what was going on in their community they recognized that some of the services that they need that they need a lot were being cut and that if they did not get out and uh, voice their uh, concerns about that that this would be detrimental to their family families and the community around them. So um, we got over 500 surveys done in less than 30 days. Um, and it was it was great. It was great to see that our people were now informed um, with good wisdom and knowledge and that they would be able to make informed decisions about the budget and the money that is being spent in their community. So we thank the Equity Com uh, Commission Council for allowing us to do that and for allowing the community to be informed. So thank you very much and have a good day. Great. Th thank you, Marquise. Uh, next, we've got Sandra Burns, then Pat Burns, then Elisa Bassler. I understand budgets. I was the president of High School District 214 when we closed schools and we redistrict the area. When I got death threats at home because the secretary thought that it was more important to keep me protected at work than rather protecting my children from answering those phone calls with those death threats. So I understand budgets, and I know how tough they are, and I know how tough your decisions are, but I think it's important for the city of Evanston to remember that the safety of our citizens is one of the reasons that we moved here, that we chose to live here. And our police and fire should be supported fully. They should be fully staffed, they should be available and ready they should be motivated to do the kind of work that they're the best at. And I look to all of you to make sure that our city remains safe and that the prettiness is not the important part. Thank you, Sandra. We've got uh, Pat and then Elisa and then uh, Sharetta Williams. Yes. Good morning. Uh, my name is Pat Burns. Uh, I'm a financial person. That was my role in life. And when I look at the budget, there's some things I don't understand, especially some timing of it. Um, you, you started in spring with a $2.9 million deficit. Two months later, three months, four months later, it's now 7.4. I don't understand why in four or five months you came up with the extra $4.5 million worth of costs is where it's coming from. Did Where were they um, in January and February? The other part is I've reviewed all 244 pages of the budget. Uh, and <laughs> what I did not find in it was a forward look that says in 2020, 21, 22, 23, 24, what the expenditures and revenues look like and if, what the deficit looks like in the future years. And I think that's an important part of planning for the future. Uh, we're faced with a 7.4 this year. What is, what's next year? That I'd like to see. Thank you. Great. Th thank you. Pat? We've got uh, Alisa Bassler, Sharetta Williams, and then um, Alderman Dolores Holmes. 
Hi, my name is Alyssa Bassler. I'm um, an Evanston resident. I live in the second ward, and I'm a proud member of the Evanston Health Advisory Committee. Um, and uh, my day job, I'm the CEO of the Illinois Public Health Institute. So I, had, I know a little bit about public health. Um, and I want to talk, I concur with everything that Don Ziegler said about the real importance of those three positions to what uh, it means to have a certified health department and be able to um, a, acquire the kinds of grants and funding and state funding and so on. I mean, that, it's just cutting our nose off to spite our face if we don't stay a certified health department. We just, we'll just keep losing and losing and losing. But what I want to talk about is something a little more intangible and really why I live in Evanston. Because I live in Evanston because of the quality of life and the diversity of Evanston and the, the commitment that I think we make in Evanston to every resident, to their quality of life, to uh, the health of everybody who lives here, and the advancing the, the life and quality for people who may not start out with what I or bring to the, you know, in terms of income and so on, the things that I have and that I'm lucky enough to achieve. And though that part of it is the intangible and really critical piece that the health department and health and human services department plays. This health, I've seen a lot of health departments, this health and human services department plays, which is that the leadership that we show there to, to move toward health equity, to convene partners to move co in the same direction, to work with all of our social service agencies, the two hospitals in Evanston, the health, other health providers in Evanston, Erie Family Health Center, the substance use prevention groups in Evanston, and just on and on and on, the large number of um, community partners that work together day in and day out toward a, common goals of advancing the health and equity of people in, in the community. And if we fund this health department in such a way that it's like, put your head down, staff, just get the day-to-day -day done, don't show any leadership, don't be out there in the community, get what has to be done, done don't have an operations leadership so that we can also be a community leader. I think we're selling Evanston residents really short and that the long-term outcomes of that, of not having the kind of leadership that brought, for instance, Erie Family Health Center to Evanston a few years ago, some work that's being done around mental health and behavioral health and diversion from the criminal justice system for people with behavioral health issues that are a burden on our police department, right, and are causing higher, higher calls to the police that we don't, we could potentially not have if we had a health department that's able able to work in partnership with community partners to to address what you know think, pe things that should not be part of the criminal justice system and so on so i really think that what we really need to be thinking about is long term and the really important not as easily quantified tangible things that the health and human services department does but the really important things that help, that bring this community together and make this community a healthy safe place to live for everybody and those three positions are really critical to that job of the health department, the job of any health department, and the job that our health department does so well. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Elisa. Uh, Charlotte, Charletta Williams, uh, Dolores Holmes, and then Bill Lynch, and then Tim Govett. Good morning. Uh, my name is Charletta Williams. I am here with um, Advocates for Action. Sure. I'm here with Advocates for Action, um, and we would like to just reiterate the importance of community voice, not only hearing it and seeking it out, but listening as well. Uh, with the budget survey here, I'm going <clears> to <throat> let Glenn uh, speak a little more to it, but I would like to pass out some of those surveys to you guys so you can see exactly <clears throat> what we did um, when we went out into our community. Thank you. This is a brief survey that we handed out to people that were um, not just fell between the cracks, but were forced between the cracks by the city doing a very poor job of recognizing its own citizens in need. You know, Fifth Ward, we're, we're woke. Second Ward is woke. Thanks, Robin. You know, we are going to make a push right now to hold everybody accountable for their actions. 
because you're no longer going to allow this uh, corporation of Evanston to dictate our lives and cut our throats. We have city services that we need, fire departments, police departments, the same people that you call that you know are going to be there, you're going to cut their throat. That is not a good decision. That, that's, that's a mental illness. And it seems like you need our services as well. So we're going to hold everybody accountable. I'm telling the city of Evanston residents, wake up. It's time to move for action. Join us and make sure that the corporation doesn't take over and dictate our lives. Thank you. We've got uh, former Alderman Dolores Holmes, then Bill Lynch, then Tim Gilbat. Good morning. Good morning. Glad I'm not sitting on that side today. <laughs> <laughs> it's not an easy side to sit on at this time of the year when it comes time to talk about budget. And I'm not going to talk about gloom and doom because we all know that we have problems and we have to solve them together. But I do want to remind us about our health department and the legacy of that. We have the oldest health department in the state of Illinois. And I don't think we want to muddy that legacy. Now, because I have sat on the other side, and I know what a terrific staff that we have for the city of Evanston under the leadership of the greatest city manager, I think, that we've had in this city, that we can do, as I like to say, out of the box thinking you are. I know that people are cross-trained in the city of Evanston, so we can figure out how to keep our vital statistics department in the health department. We can figure that out because we have people who are cross-trained who can provide that. It doesn't have to be a service that we have to do every day. Maybe we do it three times a week. But whatever, that is a service that's needed by our community. Now, I know you say you can go to the currency exchange. Yes, you can. But guess what happens when you get there? You get an application, you fill it out, and then seven to 10 days later, you get your birth certificate or your death certificate. That doesn't work well in the community where people who look like me live. If you need to bury someone, you need that death certificate right away. So we need to think about that. Um, somebody spoke about the prettiness of Evanston. We do have a lot of prettiness, a lot of trees, but you all know what I think about trees. God will take care of them. So we can look at that budget where trees are concerned. Those are, that's a kind of out of the box thinking that I hope this committee will do. And actually I'm challenging you on doing that. I still feel that Evanston is small enough, and we all are smart enough to do whatever we need to do to keep our community together. We certainly don't need a divided community. Our budget process wasn't the greatest come out of informing people, we know that. And I know you all will fix that for next year. But we have got to do the job together. And we've got to stop attacking each other. We need to be as civil on this side of the dais that we asked you to be on that side of the dais. Thank you. Thank, thank you. We got Bill Lynch and then Tim Gobatz. Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, City Manager Bob Quitz, my name is Billy Lynch. I am the president of Evanston Firefighters Local 742. Alongside dozens of my brothers and sisters, I stand before you this morning as we collectively voice our steadfast opposition to the proposed cuts to the fire department. 
For over 90 years, Engine 24 has responded out of station number four, located at 1817 Washington Street, answering thousands upon thousands of emergency calls for service. Times have sure changed since then. The fire service itself has even seen its fair share of change since then. But what has not changed, and what will never change, is the unwavering commitment of the men and women of the Evanston Fire Department, and in particular, the men and women of Fire Station 4, to provide first-rate, unmatched public safety services to the citizens of Evanston. The fire officers who currently call Station 4 their home are three of the best firefighters we have on this job. They are captains who have confidently led their crews into structure fires and who have calmly directed their crews on critical medical calls when seconds and minutes count. Collectively, they have devoted over 77 years of service to the residents and the city of Evanston. Their professionalism and dedication to this city are a microcosm of this department and this local. Pound for pound, I will put these captains, I will put this department, and I will put this local up against any in the nation. I entrust my life to these men and women, and without hesitation and with total conviction, I would give my life for theirs. As a council, you have been tasked with difficult decisions over the next few weeks. Hard, unpopular decisions will have to be made. As I previously stated to many of you, we, Local 742, remain committed to identifying viable solutions to the financial problems the city faces. Solutions, however, that do not include firefighters and do not include fire stations, our most valuable resources. It is my expectation, and it should be your expectation as well, that this city, and in particular this city manager, provide that same level of commitment. By now you have all heard the statistics that over the last 35 years our call volume has increased by over 70 percent without a single increase in our daily staffing. In fact, we've actually lost daily staffing, a fully manned squad around that same time period. You've heard that the elimination of Engine 24 will produce about a 50 percent increase in response times to that district. And that's just assuming that Engine 21 and Engine 22, which are already our two busiest engines, are available to respond to an emergency on the West End. You, have even heard, you may even have heard from other representatives of the city that it makes sense to examine the services of the fire department when in fact someone who actually knows what they're talking about would see that an examination of the fire department would warrant an increase in daily staffing. But what you have not heard up until now and what you need to hear is this, and I do not say this lightly. If you decide to close Station 4 and effectively lay off nine firefighters, people will die. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but inevitably people will die because we were not there to save them in time. And if you don't believe me, if you think that's a scare tactic, look no further than yesterday where the Evanston Fire Department, led by the men and women of Local 742, responded to three separate calls for someone in full cardiac arrest. And in two of those calls, do you want to know who the first responding engine was to that district? Engine 24. And because of their efforts and their life-saving interventions, those residents have a shot to live. They didn't die because Engine 24 was there they'll hopefully be able to celebrate the holidays with their families. I hope I don't have to say any more than that. I will leave you all with this. When the dust settles on this budget season and we turn the page to next year, it is my hope, it is my sincere wish that on January 1st, 2019, when the first 911 call request for fire department services comes in, it is a call for service in the West End and Engine 24 as it has for the last 90 years, answers that call with pride, responding out of 1817 Washington Street. Anything less is unacceptable. Thank you. All right, thank, thank, thank you. Um, 
Did you guys combine you and Tim? Okay, thank you. All right. All right, we've got a few other folks that have signed up. Um, we've got Doreen Price, then Josh Hall, and then Jerome Summers. Um, it seems that a number of things have been brought up with our accountant friend here. And when you look at things, there's uh, missed opportunity costs, there's, um, there's hidden costs, and those things need to be weighed into decisions, and those things aren't what are expressed normally in the dollars and cents unless you know you're familiar with the operations uh, per se. So it makes it a little bit more difficult. So we use a little bit of our intuition to say something's missing. In terms of uh, <coughs> preventing losses, um, I think that during the reorganization and restructuring and the in community engagement, um, that um, empowerment um, commission led by Pat is going to move forward and work with everybody to integrate processes that will increase efficiencies and the engagement of the community. I think there's going to be a really good hope that um, communication will be so much better improved so much earlier on that just like getting ready for this meeting after Wally wrote down those notes from those little meetings and me going through those, I could see, and then also with the safety of the finding out that HHS is grant money uh, related in terms of cutting positions and finding that out came up with a solution that gave us back a million dollars. So that means you need people kind of talking and iterating until finally someone goes, oh my God, I remember this or that, because it's complicated, obviously. Um, I would uh, beg that there's more focus on engagement early on, that we keep the people who are there who are doing really good jobs, that in the mixtures of what we're going to be best in terms of an overall uh, restructuring, that those people are going to be essential. And I don't think there'll be any extra people. I think you'll be asking for more. And we'll be able to justify it on the basis of the quality of life and the prevention of disease and the helping with regard to stress, with regard to residents who are poor. It's hard and difficult and extremely stressful to be poor. So um, I think we have a great city and where we're headed is actually really, really good and we're going to learn from our mistakes. So Fountain Square should be a starting place. How can we avoid it in the future? I think small meetings like what Wally had early on and in planning and development and engagement like Pat's going to be defining in terms of equity are key. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Doreen. Uh, Josh uh, Hall, then Jerome Summers, then Claire Kelly. Good morning, everybody. I am a personal care assistant and a home care aide. I am a CNA by trade. I work in the eighth ward. Also work with two individuals that have taken on the task to care for family, friends, and those are our community that need help but want to keep their independence. I couldn't imagine an individual that has a pulse of 140 and rising have to wait. I couldn't imagine someone that has a blood pressure 198 over, over 86 has to wait. I realize with each one of the stations, the response time is about less than two minutes. But then when we take away a station, I couldn't imagine an individual having to wait and every last second, every second ticking, every minute going, soon irreversible changes will happen to, this, to our residents of Evanston who said, I want to be here, I want to be independent, and I want to live a life that's full. And so when we have to pull from other areas just to receive help to us, it dilutes their areas. And then other areas of Evanston are now at risk. There are many times when Ridge had to be shut down because the individuals I was with was at risk. And I thank God for the individual that came quickly to take that person with me so they can get the care that they need. The individual of Evanston has came here because they believe this is a town that would take care of them, but also there's pride in this city that we take care of our own, period. Today I'm here with you, sharing the stories of individuals that have told me that I worry about those who come here because they don't want to go into a nursing home. They want to stay independent and they're thankful that there's such a response time that can't be beat. I'm here today to encourage you to take a good look at the individuals that have came to Evanston because they love Evanston and because they feel safe. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Josh. Uh, we've got Jerome, Jerome Summers. Come on up, Jerome. And then Claire Kelly, then uh, Peggy Tarr. Okay, my name is Jerome Summers. My family's been here in the Fifth Ward for over 100 years. So there's a little background that I have here. 
Uh, I'm also a former board member of District 65, so I've done budgets before. And I view the budget as a, not only as a financial document, but also as a tangible expression of what we value and what we value less. Um, the budget tells the story of who we are as, an, as individuals and as a community. This is another way to help make the issues and the people more visible. Clarity leads to power. And what I see in this budget, a, lar a large part of it is the poor, the sick, the weak, the young, the old, the mentally ill, they're in trouble with this budget. So I'm not only looking at the budget, but you know, we look at you. You are here to represent us, one, but also to defend people who cannot defend themselves. That's, that's part of our job. Um, how do we treat the, the least of our children? That's, you know, that's, a, that's a, a Christian thing. How do you treat the least of God's children? That's uh, it's a big deal. I look at the the uh, jobs program with Mr. Brown, uh, especially the uh, all the jobs and the and the dividing of that program, the expungement program. We have some ex offenders here that could be easily well, I don't know if easily or not, but could get their sentences expunged. It's a big deal. That's things. Those kinds of things affect people the rest of their lives. Uh, the mentally ill. The the um, certification for medical. All of that's a big deal for the city of Evanston. This is this city is not only uh, a you know a bubble and a beacon of light in Illinois but also in America and we need to maintain that standard. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Jerome. Uh, Claire Kelly, Peggy Tarr, um, Betty Astaner. I can't really read maybe it's Betty Esther. Yeah, Betty Esther. Okay, welcome. Good morning. Um, Peggy Tarr went home sick and asked me to read this for her on her behalf. On behalf of Peggy Tarr, disappointed does not come close to describing my reaction to the continuation of discriminatory <laughs> practices by the city of Evanston. I hold the city manager, city council, and mayor responsible for these practices. Several cases filed against the city by city employees were publicized in which the city was found guilty of discrimination and made to pay settlements or tax dollars to the charging parties. Now the proposed Evanston budget cuts include the laying off firing of two African American employees in the streets department. One of these employees filed an EEOC complaint against the city approximately two years ago, and the other allegedly defended an African-American female city employee that was eventually fired. Does the city comprehend what retaliation is? Another possibility of discrimination is the city's proposal to cut the youth program under Kevin Brown, an African-American. It has been suggested that Mr. Brown did not bow his head or shuffle along, as is demanded and expected of African-Americans in the presence of those deemed powerful. Evanston should be ashamed of itself, but bobbleheads, whether white, black, brown, yellow, or red, do not usually disagree. <clears throat> And there are many that believe that the proposal to demolish Harley Clark is another example of bigotry and discrimination. It seems that there are Evanstonians that would rather demolish the building than risk having non-white, non-rich folks, AKA the Evanston community, patronize Harley Clark and contaminate their neighborhood. That was Peggy Tarr, and I'd like to just make a short statement. Um, I'd like to add a comment in reference to the department station uh, in the fire department station for closing, city council has been busy approving high-rise plan developments, marketing to millennials as well as to seniors. These numerous developments totaling thousands of residents will include high-risk construction on the near sites, um, as sadly we experienced recently, those risks. The needs of our fire department are going to drastically increase with all these developments. How are you even considering the closing of a fire station? How could you even consider this um, when the needs are only going to increase? Thank you. Thank, thank you. Uh, we've got Betty Esther, Ray Freeman, then Michelle Hayes. Uh, 
Good morning. Um, at this budget hearing, one of the things when we do our budget process and everything, there is a statement that the state says you must do truth in taxation. We are in a process of levying funds and everything so we can tax me and the rest of the residents and even you. One of the things that I looked at the budget, I looked at that simulated thing, and the only thing I could see was, okay, in looking at Robert Crown, what would you do with that? First of all, I wouldn't have started it. I was in a deficit in 2016, maybe 2015. I didn't go back that far. Definitely in 2017, going into a debit in 2018. There were several projects that were started in 2017. I would not have started those because I'm looking at my books and my books is saying I don't have the money and stuff to do that. Because you're going to have to, some people keep asking, and the speaker after me keep asking, how are you going to pay for this? You have been, and if you read closely, you have to read every line, and you state what you're going to do in one document that you have in there, and it talks about how the budget and stuff is going to be taken care of. There's a paragraph that talks about this budget deficit that we have. It will, we're not doing a municipal tax levy. That is when the city says, I need to levy this amount of this, I need this much money, so I'm going to levy against your property this percentage. We are not doing that. So what happened is our deficit in for the past three years, it has been going to Cook County sets what your taxes are going to be. Because Cook County will sell bonds to get money for you. I see you shaking your head, but if that is wrong, that's what was printed in that document. So in truth and taxation, then you need to explain to us exactly what did that meant. You are not levying a municipal levy. The, the general obligation debt is set in, in county and Cook County levy what they will charge and what they will need to collect from us to pay the further bonds that they are selling. Now, if that's wrong, then please, you have to explain to us exactly, step by step, how is this going to happen? Because one thing that is sure, if we don't pay it, then we go into bankruptcy, then you in state receivership. I don't think we want that, but that's where we are headed. Projects that could have waited, and we should have been deciding to wait for these projects. That is not that much benefit to the community that they are giving that they could not wait a year or two before we put them in place. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hester. And, and Wally, just on, on that point, when we do later, whether it's Monday or, or today, I would like the CFO just to make sure everybody's clear on how the levy how the levies work. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Ne next up, uh, we've got Ray Friedman and then Michelle Hayes. Good morning, Mayor Haggerty, City Council, <coughs> City Clerk Reed. City Manager, do we have breakfast? <laughs> it's too early for me. Um, looking at the whole, I guess, budget crisis for the past three years, it appears it's been around for a while, two, three years. Um, I don't understand it. 
why we can't balance the budget in you know two three years after speaking with neighbors and friends we realize this is a much more serious issue than we thought you're pitting neighbor against neighbor when you propose to cut certain programs and employees cut police employees fire department employees and close a fire station then cut some of the programs to help the most needy and underserved yes you'll save 4.3 million in spending cuts and increase revenue by 3.3 million in taxes and fee cuts it is our opinion that there's no need to cut any programs or employees and there's no need to raise taxes and fees <coughs> you just voted to raise our debt ceiling by $37 million. And your spending is just plain out of control. You're borrowing from Peter to pay Paul, 50 million for Robert Crown, plus 35 million to co cover debt service and new projects. Six to seven million for Fountain Square, two million for 130 Chicago Avenue, one and a half million for a theater project, 1.8 million for wage increases this year and 2 million in wage increases last year. And we don't have a balanced budget. These six items alone total $97 million. And there are many more expenses I started going through just this year, the last 10 months, with 30 to 40 new vehicles and uh, planting trees and landscaping and um, Anyhow, um, it, th why is our priority-based budget questionnaire not including any of this $97 million that I just mentioned? Um, it includes small expenses, not large expenses. Um, by the way, when you finish Robert Crown, it'll be operating at a loss. Um, what are the operating costs of the new Robert Crown? How many new employees will be needed? How much more will it cost in utilities and maintenance? And how are we paying for all this? Please listen to your residents here. By the way, I agree with everything that everyone spoke about and said before me. Um, we are letting you know what our priorities are. We can and should remodel both Harley Clark and Robert Crown. Um, they should not be pitted against each other. Please don't tell us the problem is lack of finances when you're spending millions on new projects. You need to make some serious changes now without cutting programs and jobs and without raising taxes and fees. Just cut your spending that are, with projects that are not a priority. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Ray. Uh, we've got Michelle, Michelle Hayes. And Michelle's the last, uh, last person that signed up for public comment on the budget. Hi, thank you, City Council. Thank you, um, City Clerk Reed, for fixing, uh, allowing me to speak today. Um, I just, I guess I want to ask why we're standing here again. I don't, uh, I am a stay-at-home parent. I do the budgeting for our family. You know, we budget for things that we know, costs that we know are coming up, that we have agreed we spend on housing, health care, um, education, you know, the extras that we need to do. And then when we have extra expenses, we either get extra income um, or we don't do it if, if we don't have the money for it. I'm confused as to why the city isn't doing that sort of budgeting. It seems like right now the city, we have a budget that the citizens have agreed on that we that is comprised mostly of necessities that we're talking about cutting. And then we have a bunch of stuff that feels extra to me that we're funding instead of the necessities. I feel like this budget hearing system has been set up 
so that citizens get riled up about emotional issues and don't look at the bigger picture of how we are structuring our budget and whether we're keeping the things that we said we want. I think it's completely irresponsible to remove programs like Station 4, like the Youth Services Division, like the Health Department, that are necessities for citizens of Evanston. While we have, we're talking about recreation and arts and you know things that we, we don't have right now, we don't have a Harley Clark Mansion program. We need to start somewhere with a budget that says this is our, these are our base expenses, these are the things that we're going to fund, and the other things come with extra money. And part of that is we have different kinds of income. Some of it is fungible and some of it is steady. Why are we not making sure that the steady income that we have through, through concrete systems goes towards the things that we have to pay for, like public safety and health, like making sure that everyone has access? Why is it that we aren't putting money away for things like Robert Crown and Harley Clark and, you know, I'm with Alderman Holmes on trees. You know, I, I don't understand. So I, you know, I listened to the budget meeting on Monday and I was very confused when aldermen were asking questions about the youth division program. And the answer was something like, why are you asking questions about it? Well. If I were an alderman, I would want a report that said that, you know, the people who were purported to be experts in these areas were a part of the decision. You know, I, I would want to know, I, I feel like we're making these decisions based on our emotional reaction to whatever it is and not on facts. And that is a big problem. I mean, I know more than most because my husband's a firefighter that there are facts involved with closing station four. But we're reacting to the closure in a very emotional way, which I think is not the way that you budget. So I, I just, I'm very concerned about how this is happening and I'm very unhappy with how city management and city council are allowing the budget to become a, a you know, a, an emotional mess rather than a quantified, studied, data-driven um, decision-making process. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Is there, before, uh, before we close this discussion, is there any additional uh, person that would like to speak on the public budget? I would like to speak on the public budget. Um, I'd like to know and ask you all if your life. State your name, please. Yes, yeah, state your name for the record, please. Um, Pat Betke Brunger, and I'm speaking on behalf of the fire department. I'd like to know if you think your life is worth $20. How many of you think your life is worth $20? We have 70,000 residents in the city of Evanston. If every resident broke it down and paid $20, we would be able to fund and keep Station 4 open. I think we think of the budget as being this great big picture, but when you break it down, $20, if you asked everybody to put $20, take it over to Station 4, I think you'd be surprised how many people would come over to Station 4 and put in their $20 to keep it open. It's been open for many years. We've always had five stations. I worry about, we call it's called the jump system with the fire department. Um, when Station 4 closes, our closest one will be either Simpson or Madison and it's two minutes now that the fire station can get to my house. When that happens, it could be four minutes. My grandson could be dead by that time. He has high peanut allergies. We keep an EpiPen, but that doesn't always mean that he's outside and the EpiPen is immediately in our dispose. So I just want you to think seriously, how valuable is your life? And if you lived in the ward, the ninth ward, would you want to keep it open? Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Pat. Is there anyone else that would like to speak on the proposed budget? Okay, well thank you, thank you everybody for coming out and speaking so eloquently uh, about the, the various uh, issues and challenges that confront this city council. Um, 
hearing nothing, hearing nothing further, uh, I ask if there's a motion to adjourn this meeting. The, excuse me, just this hearing. Um, is there a, I move that we adjourn. Is there a second? second? Okay, city clerk, could you take the roll, please? Alderman Braithwaite. Aye. Alderman Wen. Aye. Alderman Wilson. Aye. Alderman Ruth Simmons. Aye. Alderman Stufferton. Aye. Alderman Ravel. Aye. Alderman Rainey. Aye. Alderman Fisk. All right, so that, that hearing is adjourned uh, on a nine to zero vote. We're now going to move into the second hearing of the day. Excuse me, eight, eight to zero. Uh, Alderman Fleming uh, couldn't be here today. Uh, eight to zero. We're going to move into the second hearing of the day, which is the truth and taxation hearing for the 2018 property tax levy for the city of Evanston. The Evanston City Council is conducting a public hearing on the 2018 property tax levy. The purpose of this hearing is to allow for public input on the proposed levy. There will be no final action today on the tax levy. I hereby convene the hearing for the 2018 property tax levy to be open. Uh, the CFO earlier presented uh, information about the tax levy as well. Uh, we have had uh, one person sign up for this public hearing, uh, and that is Janad Rizki. Well, first I will talk about this a little bit. The issue is um, the council for some years has played this game with these levies and pretended they're not raising the property taxes, but they raise the other levies. And they've done this consistently and then said we never raised the property tax. But that's been done. And I haven't looked at each one of these levies and its, its effect, but some are going up. So I want people to understand they are raising taxes. And even if they're not on the the property tax, so to speak, or the general fund levy, they're raised basically on other levies. So, I mean, that's where truth in taxation lies, but I think um, what, what keeps bothering me about is the whole issue of truth. The truth is, you know, basically a truthful budget is what we need to have, and we just do not have that. And uh, you can levy and do all these things, but if there's no truth to what we're doing, we have a problem. And that's why we're in this huge problem. And, uh, I, you know, I think people are, 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 don't understand just how bad it is because I keep looking at it and realize the property tax here is going to go up dramatically. There's no way around it. It's going to go between 30 and 50 percent is where it's going to go because of the mess we have here to keep it in some kind of shape. You're, you're not gonna, you're, that's where this is going. That's this, you're going to be levying that kind of property tax increase, which a $10,000 tax bill will add $1,000 probably to it from the city alone. That's what's going to happen because the place is in a mess. And some of the, you know, I don't know one of the speakers said there's luxuries of trees and things like that. Well, there's not proper analysis done here of anything, and that's the problem. I asked, you know, I sent an email to this council about the firefighters and basically whether the, this overtime was excessive or their problems. Well, I did talk to somebody in the fire department outside here, and they're telling me it's not a problem. And it, you saw my email, and that's basically, not, it's peanuts to keep it going. So we don't have to close the station. The station goes and you run the overtime until it's done, until you can fix it and get more firefighters back. But it's not going to be fixed for several years, because I said it's going to cost millions to fix this mess. And the same with the police. I don't get. I haven't gotten an answer or seen anything. And this is about truth. Where's the truth? We, we're down ten. We, we had thirteen police officers for shift. We're down to ten. So what's going on here? That where's the truth in this? You're, you're, you know, I'd like to know what's going on. Where's truth? You know, what's any? There's no analysis. It's just a knee-jerk reaction that's unacceptable. That's the problem here. I don't see analysis. Are we in trouble because we're down to 10 officers a shift? Do we have a problem? Nobody's telling us anything. So, um, and what's the analysis? Nothing's been done. This is a problem. Everything here is done like this. It's not, and I think Ms. Hayes made me made the comment too. There's no analysis. It's not about luxury, though. So you go and you stop just paying for the elm trees to, to, to inject those trees. You'll spend millions to cut them down. Millions. You'll spend double what you're paying, as an example. So the, many of these things, the, the analysis has to be done properly, and it hasn't been done. Mr. Bob Quitz has not done analysis. He's just balancing a budget is what he's doing on the backs of everything. Anything he wants to cut, he cuts. Well, that's not business. That's not, and, I, and I think the other speakers are mentioning the same thing I keep mentioning. It's all the problems. These lawsuits went out of control. Why they went out of control? 
It's a big problem. And that's why we should not be here at this point. Those lawsuits should have never happened. And that's why our budget is hurt. There's been excessive spending here and gifts to people, basically, for special interests that have cost us millions. And all these problems and all the capital projects. Robert Crown is a big problem. Why would we start a project not knowing how we're going to pay for it? That is really what's interesting. You didn't know the budget impact of Robert Crown on this city, and you started a project. And now that project's basically a 10% property tax increase. Then that's a problem. So what management is that? How do you manage? What, what kind of management do we have here? You start something, and, and you do it. Because you wanted to do it, you said, oh, we'll do it. And Gibbs Morrison, I thought, was ridiculous, too, because that was never an approved thing through the rec department and was just done. Everything here has been just done because Mr. Bob Kutz, a council member, wanted to do something. The theater on Howard Street is ridiculous. We're in a budget crisis a year ago, and you approve a theater for $1.5 million. So, you know, I'm sorry. This crisis is because of this mismanagement. It's not because of these programs. You look it up there on the general fund and the CFO says, oh, they're tracking fine. Of course they're tracking fine. They're not out of control. What's out of control is all this other stuff that you let get out of control. And that's why we have a problem here. So we can think about it some more. Thank you. And keep smiling, Wally. Thank you. Thank you, Janad. Is there anyone else that would like to speak about the 2018 property tax levy? Okay, seeing, seeing no more. Uh, uh, sure, Alderman uh, uh, Wilson. I live here too, so I guess I can. Go. Sure. The word truth, it keeps getting thrown around a lot. The fact of the matter is, if you were curious and you wanted to know facts, the city has the information available for the most part on the website. If you're curious, you can find out an awful lot about all this stuff, okay? Uh, and it's readily available. You don't have to do a FOIA, you can look things up. For example, if we go back 10 years ago, our income tax uh, amount was about, that we received is about $6.2 million. Now that's budgeted about seven. Okay, so 10 years ago, it's only gone up from 6.2 to seven, okay? Home rule sales tax, about 10 years ago, it was around $6 million. Now it's about $6 million. 10 years ago, sales tax was about 9 million. Now it's about 10. Property tax, 10 years ago, 34.8. Now, 28.3, okay? When we look at the police and fire pension, and again, I don't want anybody to misconstrue this, but that was $9 million, and now it's $18 million. So it's not super complicated to figure out the math on that. Ten years later, everything costs a lot more. Ten years later, we're facing a situation where we have declining revenues. So what do we do? We have to make choices on getting other income and revenue options available. We struggle up here to look for other options that are the least regressive options available to the community, okay? That's the fact of the matter. That's the truth. We are attempting to give a proper and appropriate contribution to the pensions every year. We could go with the state minimum, and we see where the state minimum got the city for you know decades and decades. It's a massive hole. We're trying to dig out of that hole one shovel full at a time. So yeah, is it $3 million more than the state minimum? Right. But we have to apply ourselves to catch up on these things. Nobody's making anything up. Nobody's not being truthful. Nothing's not transparent. This is all on the table. And if somebody wanted the information, it's readily available. So I just wanted that to be clear, because we're talking about this levy. And to hear about how it's being hidden or anything like that, that is just simply not factual. So thank you. Okay. Thank you, Alderman Wilson. Okay, hearing nothing further uh, in terms of uh, public public comment on that, um, I um, hereby request a motion to adjourn this hearing. So moved. Is there a second? second. City Clerk, could you take the roll? Alderman Braithwaite. Alderman Nguyen. Aye. Alderman Wilson. Aye. Alderman Ruth Simmons. Aye. Alderman Sufferden. Aye. Alderman Ravel. Aye. Alderman Rainey. Aye. Alderman Fisk. All right, that is the tax levy public hearing is adjourned on a vote of eight to zero by the Evanston City Council.
Okay, ne next up on the agenda is uh, Mayor Public Announcements. Um, I have no announcements today. A city Manager? None. City Clerk? As, as, as always, during election time, uh, my only announcement is that early voting is going on now downstairs in room G300. So if you're in the audience and you live in suburban Cook County, you likely, if you're here, you likely live in Evanston, uh, just pop down to room G300 before the, uh, before five o'clock and you can vote. Early voting is also available tomorrow on Sunday as well as, uh, next week, uh, 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. throughout the weekday, Saturday, 9 to 5, and then Sunday, 10 to 4 next week as well. Um, you can also volunteer with the clerk's office. We have folks in the office daily uh, making phone calls and knocking on doors. In fact, today at, I believe at 12 o'clock, we'll have some folks down in the office um, uh, making phone calls. So you can join us for that to get out voters in the lowest turnout wards, which are the 5th, 8th, and 2nd. Thank you. Okay. Uh, just a quick question that I have. Uh, do, do you have a uh, do you have a count of how many people have early voted so far in Evanston as of, you say, yesterday? Uh, every day we've had uh, over 600 people. Yesterday was our highest turnout with uh, slightly over 700 folks. Uh, I don't, I haven't calculated the total, but I can give you okay. that That's number great. in a second. Okay. Terrific. Terrific. All right. Uh, next up on our agenda is public comment. I know we've had a lot of public comment on the budget and the levy. Uh, I don't believe there's anyone else that there's anyone that signed up for this general public comment today is folks who sign up for the oh we do have Janad. Oh, okay, you Janad? Come on up, come on up. Did you sign up for the regular public comment, Janad? All right, come up, come on up. And then uh, if there's any if there's anybody else out there that wants to speak at this general public comment, please uh, let me know or just line up up here uh, behind Janad. All right, thank you. Let's talk about something else. And, I, you know, I think the issue about truth, what is, you know, I think it's an interesting thing. It's, it's all there. Well, you know, I, I've been asking about the water department for five years. The water department is colluded with the city budget. And, you know, the water tank at Northwestern, as I recall, was $18 million. But now I see a, saw a number on the overhead at $25 million. So, you know, it's a colluded budget. The, the water department should have been operated as a separate business. I've asked for it for years. Really, we need to bring somebody in here that can run it and do it and look at it. Because frankly, you know, this thing is, oh, we're getting gold, we're selling water. Well, you got a lawsuit with Skokie, we're spending money on legal fees. You know, they were getting tiny amounts of money from Lincolnwood. They have 7,000 customers. So what are we really getting here? And, and, you know, we basically, but nobody's analyzed that budget. That's a big budget that's being misused, the money. And then Mr. Bob Kowitz is, is raising, basically flip-flopping the water rates to sewer rates. Well, from the sewer rates to the water rates. So, you know, it's, it's a game. It's a, another mess. And, you know, it's, it's, it's not truthful because you're not operating it as a business. You know, someone will say, oh, go look at the books. You can't look at the books because the books are so colluded, you don't know what's going on. Nobody can figure it out, and no alderman can give me an intelligent answer of what's going on. And that's a problem, too, because you're the decision makers to know what's going on. Every time he comes up here and asks for something, you just approve it, well, well, that's fine. You don't know if that business is even solvent, really. But it's always been solvent on the back of the water rate payers of Evanston had to pay for it. And the mayor did promise when he campaigned he'd look into all this, but I, you know, I think he wanted you know, the contracts. But you know, it's, it's a mess. So the truth is really a very big issue. And, and the public, I believe, is losing quite a bit of confidence in what's going on here. It's not me. It's not me. I'm, not, I'm just one of many people. The numbers of FOIAs here, and Mr. Reed will probably tell you, were in a couple years ago were 700 FOIAs for the year. At this point, where I believe we're close to, getting close to 1,200 in October. And uh, you know, a lot of people have gone to the um, Attorney General because the city's not giving us information. And then I've made my first inquiry there, but I know many other people have been there to ask questions of what's going on here. So a lot of people in town are pretty upset with what's going on. So I think council members better better here again understand these things. We've got to be truthful. We've got to have the right analysis. And I, you know, frankly, if, if, you know, I believe the mayor is a successful businessman. You, I assume you do proper analysis when you do things. There's been no proper analysis here done of many, many things. <laughs> Never do we get any good numbers. Never do we get anything. I'm sorry, the numbers are not good. They're just basically what people want. So that's why we're in big trouble. 
and I'm done. Thank you. This is the last time I speak today. Thank you, thank you, John. All right, uh, Claire, come on up. Uh, Peggy Tarr asked to add, wanted to add one last comment regarding the budget, uh, and she says, I feel that the proposed budget in general punishes the disenfranchised by eliminating services and introducing or increasing charges for necessary services. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Is there a Justin Phillips? Oh, come on up, Ray, if you want to speak at the general. And then is there a Justin Phillips? Okay. I just wanted to add one more thing. In looking at the budget, you, ha you know that you have so much money coming in. So if you're going to figure out a budget, you need to know how much money is going out. But there's a deficit. So I don't understand why this can't be balanced. And if you're going to well, pass a uh, a Robert Crown budget of $50 million, which I still try and, trying to wrap my head around. Why would you start a business that you know when it's finished and you put $50 million into it, it's operating at a loss? And it's going to continue to operate as a loss. So I don't understand why we'd put, I understand it being rebuilt. Um, I, I feel strongly it should be rebuilt, the same as I think Harley Clark should be rebuilt. And I don't understand why they both can't be done. But you have so much money to work with, and you know. I mean, that's the city, I guess, is operating as a business. So as a business, you have so much money to work with, and this is how much money you have to spend. So why can't we work with that and keep all the residents happy? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> We'd like to keep everybody happy. We like that, Ray. Okay. Um, let's see. Is there any Anyone else? I just wanted to, you asked about the early voting uh, totals thus sure, far. Sure. Uh, we are at 3,307 uh, early voters thus far. We're, we're still in third place. We're a few hundred behind uh, Northbrook. Uh, so if Evanston voters can get us into second place and eventually into first place, which is Orland Park, that'd be uh, great. Uh, if, so maybe we can talk to the churches about doing the souls to the polls next Sunday uh, to make sure we get folks out to vote. Tomorrow, right. even better tomorrow. All right. Well, that's that's Thank good you. news. Evanston uh, being amongst the leaders as usual in voting. So that's terrific. Um, okay. See, seeing no one else uh, has signed up uh, for public comment, we're now going to move on to the special orders of business for today. Uh, I'd like to ask Alderman Rainey, uh, as the senior alderman, if you would take us through. Uh, excuse me. Excuse me, through S SP5, yeah. Um, if you could take us through SP5, and then I'll ask the city manager and staff to do SP6. Uh, and uh, we will need to vote on each of these. Uh, as I mentioned earlier today, these tax levies, of which uh, the SP1 through 5 are, are all for introduction today. Um, they are not for action. That will be a subsequent meeting. Alderman Rainey? All right. Um, Mr. Mayor, you want me just to introduce all from SP1 to SP6, right? Yeah, and I believe we need to do each one and vote uh, individually on each one. I was told earlier today. That's that's correct. So we're gonna we're gonna do we're gonna do five votes on each one. So I'll need you to put it up. Mo motion for an introduction. Have somebody second, and then uh, we'll have any discussion if anybody wants, and then the city clerk will take the roll. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. SP1, Ordinance 123-018 is for introduction. This is the City of Evanston 2018 tax levy. Next. Okay. 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 All right, could you guys do me a favor just because it's short and I just want the public and everybody to understand if we could just, uh, so for folks that are watching from home, know the amount of money. Um, <clears throat> well, why don't I just read it? Sure. Um, with this this levy uh, levies the annual property tax for general fund operations, Illinois Municipal Retirement Fund, police and fire pension funds, and the general assistance fund totaling thirty million seven hundred and three thousand two hundred and sixty dollars. Um, the previous levy was thirty million one hundred one thousand two hundred and nineteen dollars. This is for introduction. Is there a second? See, seeing no discussion, City Clerk, could you take the roll? Alderman Braithwaite. Aye. Alderman Wynn. Aye. Alderman Wilson. Aye. Alderman Ruth Simmons. Aye. Alderman Suffredin. Aye. Alderman Ravel. Aye. 
Alderman Rainey? Aye. Alderman Fisk? All right, SB1, Ordinance 123-0-18, City of Evanston, 2018 tax levy, uh, passes for introduction on an 8-0 to vote. SB2 is Ordinance 124-018, this is for introduction, the Evanston Library Fund, uh, 2018 tax levy. The board requests introduction of tax levy 124018 for the library board's action on October 17, which levies the annual property tax for the public library in the amount of $6,887,755. This is for introduction. Second. Seeing no discussion, City Clerk, could you take the roll, please? Alderman Berthwick? Alderman Wynn? Aye. Alderman Wilson? Aye. Alderman Ruth Simmons? Aye. Alderman Sufferton? <coughs> Alderman Ravel? Alderman Rainey? Aye. Alderman Fisk? SB2, Ordinance 124-0-18, Evanston Library Fund, 2018 tax levy passes for introduction of the City Council on an 8-0 vote. Ordinance 125-018, the Solid Waste Fund, 2018 tax levy is also for introduction. Uh, this levy uh, is the annual property tax for the Solid Waste Fund in the amount of $836,735. Seeing no discussion, City Clerk, could you take the roll, please? Alderman Braithwaite? <coughs> Alderman Wynn? Alderman Wilson? Aye. Alderman Ruth Simmons? Aye. Alderman Sufferton? Alderman Ravel? Aye. Alderman Rainey? Aye. Alderman Fisk? SB3, Ordinance 125-0-18, Solid Waste Fund 2018 tax levy passes the Evanston City Council for introduction on an 8-0 vote. Ordinance 126-018 is the Special Service Area Number 4, uh, 2018 tax levy. Uh, we request the tax levy ordinance. This tax le levy ordinance um, is the annual property tax for special services area number four and is in the amount of $535,714 for introduction. Second. <coughs> Seeing no discussion, City Clerk, could you take the roll, please? Alderman Braithwaite? Aye. Alderman Wynn? Aye. Alderman Wilson? Aye. Alderman Ruth Simmons? Aye. Alderman Sufferton? Aye. Alderman Ravel? Aye. Alderman Rainey? Aye. Alderman Fisk? SB4, Ordinance 126-0-18, Special Service Area Number 4, 2018 Tax Levy, passes the Evanston City Council for introduction on an 8-0 vote. Ordinance 127-018 is the Special Service Area Number 6 Tax Levy for 2018. Um, this levy uh, is for the annual property tax for special service area number six and is in the amount of $225,510. Move introduction. Second. <coughs> Seeing no discussion, City Clerk, could you take the roll, please? Alderman Braithwaite? Aye. Alderman Wynn? Aye. Alderman Wilson? Aye. Alderman Ruth Simmons? Aye. Alderman Sufferton? Aye. Alderman Ravel? Aye. Alderman Rainey? Aye. Alderman Fisk? <laughs> SB5, Ordinance 127-0-18, Special Service Area Number 6, 2018, Tax Levy, passes the Evanston City Council uh, for introduction on an 8-0 vote. Thank you, Alderman Rainey. Uh, City Manager Bob Kowitz, you take us through SB6. Yes, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, good morning. Uh, we have uh, two final uh, staff uh, presentations uh, to complete uh, uh, the initial discussion on the budget. Uh, I'd like to ask Pat Effiam, our uh, uh, chief equity officer, uh, to come up. As you know, uh, we have been committed to use an equity lens in looking at the budget. Um, this will be the second year uh, that we have done this. I think uh, uh, last year was uh, a general overview uh, this year, uh, Dr. Effiam has been able to uh, uh, give a, a closer analysis uh, to uh, this budget uh, on the issues of equity. Uh, so she's here to uh, make a presentation. Uh, then we will, um, uh, Ms. Luz Lakin and myself, will review um, some additional public input we've received from the Balancing Act uh, software, uh, the community meetings that we've had, uh, and then that will conclude uh, staff presentations on the budget. So. Dr. Effiam, good morning. Good morning, Mayor Haggerty, members of the council, City Clerk Reed, and uh, City Manager Bob Kowitz, Pat Effiam, Chief Equity Officer for the City of Evanston, and I have come to make a report with you about budgeting with an equity lens. Let's see if I can get our clicker to work. Where do I click, Kate? <clears throat> Thank you. 
So in looking at uh, what we were looking at in terms of equity, um, our, my challenge, our job, my ch uh, charge was to look at the bucket budget um, from an equity lens process. So we first had to define the problem, which is this $7.4 million deficit that we have. Uh, we needed an answer, and the answer for that was $7.4 million balanced budget. Uh, so how do we get to that with an equity lens? And it's called the process was pri priority-based budgeting. The goal of the uh, priority-based budgeting was to allow city staff, council, and community members to look at and review all the services provided by the city uh, prior to the creation of the budget, and we wanted to do that with an equity lens. Uh, and so we started with the staff internally, and the staff generated a list of 152 programs that were scored using an internal metric. That metric applied an equity lens because we uh, four of the possible 22 points out of that metric were uh, based on an equity perspective. Uh, we also had the public service. Survey. The public survey likewise looked at collecting uh, demographics. What we found in the midst of all that was that we did not have adequate participation from a, a significant port, portion of our community, that was the black and brown community. Uh, and so we set out to find an additional 500 people, uh, black and brown people in the community, uh, that we could speak to and, and get their input into this budget process. You heard from the uh, Advocates for Equity a little bit earlier. They indeed did reach 507. Uh, 507 additional people of color. Uh, there are the demographics for you. They were all African American, Hispanic, uh, some who identify as pre, uh, tra uh, biracial. Uh, they went to, they, we went into the community where we could find them. We went to laundromats and food gro grocery stores and local Mexican restaurants and to community picnics, but went into the community to find those voices. And as you heard today, they came back and provided us uh, with that information, which we now have before us. So the priority-based budget process um, did indeed, uh, we, we put it in place, we went through it, uh, and here's what we have come to now. We have these proposed cuts before us, and the city wants to know, those residents want to know, even I want to know, um, are these equitable? Are, they, are, the, are the, the proposed cuts equitable? And I guess I would have to pause here and ask the question, what is equity? And I asked the question, as someone said earlier, uh, we have thrown that word around a lot this year. And we have thrown it around without any true understanding collectively as a body about what, what equity is. So as we go through each of these programs, when I look at the Health and Human Services Department, uh, and I talk to, I in, uh, interview each of the individual directors, uh, staff members who are impacted by this, as, as well as community members, uh, the question is, what is equitable? Health and human services, the reality is, is, is it's dismantling or the, the, the loss of a health department, no matter how we look at it, uh, is going to be um, devastating for the community and for individuals, in part because we don't um, understand completely the impacts that it will have on the community. Uh, it is global, it is deep, uh, and so, uh, and people across all economics, across all demographics, people will be affected by the closure uh, of the health Health department. Now, if you look at the police department, I can tell you that absolutely yes. Um, the impact of not filling those positions will mean that we cannot advance from where we are in, in terms of being able to give even more timely service uh, to our residents in order to provide more equitable service to our residents. Um, the, the proposed budget cuts in the police department will hurt us. As you have heard, the closure of the fire department. Um, no matter what you decide, no matter what way you go, um, residents are going to be upset, persons are going to be discouraged, um, because the question becomes, what is equity? I have heard that perhaps uh, if we close a, a fire department in another neighborhood, that that would be more equitable. Uh, what I would say to you is, because we're not clear about what equity is, uh, you will have persons from each of those wards where the proposed fire department closures are recommended that will be upset, will be hurt, and yes, it will have an impact on our fire station. Mental health. Uh, particularly for our mental health community. This is significant. There is a loss of significant funding, which means a loss of cut in services to the current 5,000 uh, resident uh, persons that are currently served by that. Um, and so, again, you're looking at approximately 5,000 people plus service providers uh, who would tell you absolutely this is inequitable and absolutely this would be devastating for our community. Uh, cultural arts. 
um, looked at their report, talked to their uh, department, talked to their uh, arts people in the community. Uh, for them, they understand they understand the arts to be very equitable, um, to be able to reach all uh, walks of life. They understand that people use the arts for healing, for arts therapy, uh, that the sculptures in the community are important to the community uh, because they beautify the community. So if you ask the cultural arts department, absolutely, this would be devastating for the community. Um, the elimination of vital records. You have uh, several people who are concerned about that for good reasons, uh, including uh, met with the, cler the African American clergy uh, in the Fifth Ward last week, uh, who this will definitely impact how they're able to provide funeral services and how quickly they're able to do that because of lack of access to these uh, services. So in looking at these proposed budget cuts, uh, one of the things that I did was uh, to, cre to understand that to look at these, we needed a formula. And the formula formula is that we need the data, we take that with the community engagement from those who would be ne most negatively impacted, uh, and then if with that, I'm sorry, let me go back, with that, then and only then can we get equity. I can stand here and tell you today as your chief equity officer, equity is not an individual with an answer. So as much as you want me to provide you with a single answer, I'm going to propose to you that that answer is not held in my hand or my head. So we went to then collect this data that we needed to decide uh, when I made my report whether I could report to you that this was equitable or not. And the demographics, we, the first thing we need to look at was the demographics. Uh, of, of the proposed budget cuts, 11 are female, 6 are male, ever, 8 African American, 8 white, and 1 Asian. I can tell you that it's skewed just a little bit because in the 8 African American, two of those African American staff members who are in public works actually have bumping rights. So, so they would not actually lose their position. So we would not know who was going to lose their position and how to uh, demographically capture that information until we know who gets bumped and what that ultimately results in. The rest of the data is absent. We don't have any real data uh, and so the page blank is intentional. We don't have any data to capture to tell us whether this is equitable or not. We're missing community voices. Uh, we're missing uh, community partners. We just don't know. There is not enough information. So the information that we have is based on staff uh, cuts. And so the next step then was to engage with the community that I thought was missing, their vo whose voices were missing in this. Um, started talking with the directors. I have talked with each director uh, using a tool that comes out of, um, of Chicago, um, the racial equity assessment tool. I sat down with each of the directors. And what I can tell you is, again, there's simply not enough information. Um, the directors do not have enough information to understand collectively with each other how this would impact, how one decision would, would impact another. And I'll give you an example of that. Uh, talk, I went in talking to the fire chief and asked him how possibly the closing of Gibbs Morrison would impact his department. And initially he said, well, it really doesn't have any impact, but then when he began to think about, well, if, if we did in fact close that facility, or not as they close it, but if, it, if, it, if we did what was proposed in the budget, um, what would that mean for police and fire services? What would it mean for kids in the neighborhood who may or may not now access that building? What would that mean to the police department? How would they have to police in that area different? So what we've looked at uh, in each of these in our process, when we talk to the residents, Residents are, they're, they're reacting, as someone said, on an emotional basis. Some of them are, are reacting based on what they, their understanding of one slice of a very big pie. Uh, and, and because of that, again, you have these silos of people. Uh, then we have city council. I looked at city council goals. The goal of equity in our city council um, is to ensure equity in all of our services, operations and services. Uh, have we done that? Because remember, our goal is to make sure that there's equity in all of our services and programs, in all of our operations. Uh, have we adequately done that and how do we measure that? So the big question then becomes, um, is this budget equitable? And I would tell you absolutely yes. I would tell you that this budget is absolutely equitable because we defined equity as the process of, of defining the problem, of understanding the answer, 
and then putting a, a, a process in place. That process, we have walked through it, and we have come up with a proposed budget, and from that perspective of equity, we, this budget is ac absolutely equitable. On the other hand, I would tell you it is absolutely not equitable because we have no understanding of what equity is. We as a city have not uh, engaged in, adopted an equity lens from the top down. And so as I stand here week after week and as I listen to the council delivery, I listen to my colleagues, as I listen to residents, equity is defined very differently by all of us. And therefore, no matter how we look at this budget, it will never be equitable in anybody's mind. The, the answer to all of that is we have to stand back and instead of looking at slices of the pie, we have to be able to look globally at the entirety of the pie. I'll give you an example um, of when we don't apply equity as a process. Equity is a process. You can only get to equity through a process. And I've listened to this community over the last year, um, consistently when an issue comes up, Harley Clark, that's inequitable. Well, I will point you back to 1970 uh, when there were some real challenges with poverty, particularly in the African American community. And the USDN decided to resolve that problem by giving out bricks of cheese. And every week they would show up in the neighborhood and they would give out a brick of cheese and that would satisfy that portion of the community for that day. What it did not do was provide a solution to the overall problem. And I'm suggesting to you that if we want to talk about and get to equity in our budget and equity in our city services programs, we must stand back and stop handing out bricks of cheese. And if I can point this out to you, uh, what I'll say is this, is that consistently we hand out these bricks of cheese and we don't understand that they actually create more issues in that community than if we had not handed out the brick of cheese. When you can satisfy someone in the moment, then they go away. But as you recognize, our community keeps coming back over and over again. I can tell you that to have persons stand at the podium and say that the, uh, the African American community or black staff members are expected to bow and shuffle. It's an insult to that community because you have not engaged that community. The key here is that we must begin to engage our community. And when I say that in this process, what I would say is who was the most, who is going to be most negatively impacted? It starts not where you think it does, but with our directors. How is this going to most negatively impact our directors and the decisions they have to make? And then they would begin to understand they have to figure out who's going to most, be most negatively impacted by them. These decisions cannot be made on an individual basis. Rather, they must be made in collective collaboration with one another. I would challenge you as the City Council to understand that, that the question of equity is a process that we must be serious about this year, about getting in place and working from that process. The final thing I'll say about that is that when we don't have a process and we know, um, I'm not sure how you would define the most vulnerable population. But in the city of Evanston, I can tell you that one of our most vulnerable populations is our African-American population. That's one of our most vulnerable and historically deepest. However, what I'll say to you is when we, when we address the issues of that community one case at a time, we, we, we continue to perpetuate the inequities in that community. When we allow ourselves to racialize every incident that comes before us, when we respond to an issue and, and we vote based on that's black, and I don't, I, don't, I don't want to upset the apple cart anymore. What we're doing is a disservice to the entirety of the community. I would suggest to you that we have to get serious about talking about the issues of inequity. We have to get serious about addressing the issues of race. Those will allow us to address the issues of all other inequities in our community. But let me leave you with, equity is a process. It is not an answer. Any questions? I'll ask a question. All right. So what, what do we do better in process? I mean, we, we reach out to people, as we, we make information available, um, we engage people, we, we go to them, or they are, I think, the, the work that we did in response to the city council's concern on the, the survey where you tasked community members to go out into the community. Um, I think those are all part of process, right? 
So what what more can we do? Uh, this budget will ultimately get adopted in yep. whatever form it is, and we move on. We yes. continue as a, a as a, a city. Yep. What should we be thinking about? What 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 other processes so that when we're here twelve months from now, the the answer of the report that you give is is different so if you could talk about process yep. and i think you also raised the points of data yep. you know what else do we need to be doing yep. as a city in the coming years uh, so that we have that data as well okay thank you very good question um, and we have uh, myself and the equity empowerment commission have been addressing this issue uh, we came before the rules committee uh, i think it was last month and we are currently furiously hardly working uh, on an equity framework that answers all of what i just put before you um, and so it, once this equity framework comes out and, and we're fighting to get it out, um, get to the city council by the December 20th meeting where it can be voted on and we get that in place, that will help a tremendous amount because, number one, we will first start with setting equity goals. We will, we will, set, we will start with a tool that shows us how to adequately engage the community. We, we are defining the data now um, in the commission. What data is missing? How do we capture that? Where can we capture it? Um, so we're, we're already working on that. If you will work with us, um, um, which you have been very supportive to get that tool in place. Um, I will I will tell you, and it's not self-serving. Um, if you want the Equity Office of Equity Empowerment um, to to be able to have any credibility to do, be able to adequately do the work, we have to fund the office. Uh, one of my colleagues at the ICMA conference um, uh, last month said, "Budget is the moral compass. We 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 cannot adequately. We don't have a common language, a shared language, because we don't have a place. We don't have a mechanism through which to train all of our staff." So that we all have the common language. We need to get city council in, in, the, in, in the room and on, the, on, on board with us and understand what we're trying to do. So that as right now we need that stopgap measure, you ask Wally, the stop, what we need is a stopgap measure. I need, um, I need you all, I need city council not to respond when someone comes up and says, well, it's because I'm black that they did this. It might be, but let's collect the data. And what I'm telling you is these issues are real, these inequities are real, and we can capture them in ways that everybody can understand as opposed to responding to a black woman like myself who's standing here going, this is not fair, vote for me because I'm black, and you're uncomfortable as a white person kind of going against me, but you want some more information and you should have that more information. So we, we have to learn uh, collectively as a body, in this body, uh, how not to respond so immediately to those emotional issues that come to the surface, but rather we follow, we, we follow the system that will be in place to help us root out and collect the data that supports that and allows us to find meaningful ways to move forward as opposed to handing out another block of cheese. Does that help, Wally? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Oh, we got one more, I guess. Uh, Alderman Braithwaite. You've, you've really given me a lot uh, to think about, Dr. Effie. Um, and right now my comments are just very surface because I'm going to reflect on this over the weekend. Uh, you talked about data, and I think that that's very important. And I'd asked Erica, and I would love to be able to look at the cuts being made to our public health department, look at the percentage of cuts that are being made to our fire department, as well as our parks and recs as it relates to, uh, you know, the youth and young adult program. And I guess the data that I'm looking at is I want to know, like, department-wide, like, who's, who's being cut the most? And then I want to be able to look, from my perspective, as a black male in the community who serves on council, how is that impacting the most vulnerable community? So that's a good question. I hope, City Manager, I can have that tool. And, um, and I think some of it has been in the budget memo. Yeah, we've looked at the revenues, but I, if it's there, if I missed it, please point it to me so I can compare the revenues to, to the cuts. That would be helpful. The other question that you, you may comment on is, is the process. And throughout these budget memos, it's been clear to me that some directors weigh in on the budget cuts and other cuts are coming from, you know, the city manager. So I would, you know, I don't know how we get there, but I think it's important to understand which directors had feedback and which directors were told about these cuts. And that's that's something that's important. I also think in, in and this is just my reflection based on, on the comments from our community, and I think that those, it's important that we pay attention to that. Uh, I am curious to know more about our legal expenses. Someone said looking, looking forward, and our legal expenses are high. 
and I think if we continue down that course as a council, uh, we will continue to, you know, repeat our deficit. I also think as a council we need to take a very close look at our capital expenses, and I understand the price of material gets more. So the, the more that we delay any capital improvement, there's going to be a downstream effect. But I have to weigh that against, you know, the people that we're looking to serve. Um, so I hope that as a council we can take a very deep look and figure out where in our capital expenses uh, we may be able to delay some things. And I don't mean cancel, I say delay. And, and the reason that um, I say that is there are some things, again, the gentleman who mentioned we don't look forward, that we know. We can't bank on them, but we know that there are four developments that are going to be added over the next year. We know that we're going to see an increase in taxes uh, and permit fees from those developments that have passed. We know that we have a library lot that's most likely going to be sold over the next year. and We're going to have an infusion of $4 million. We can't put that in the budget this year. But again, if we're looking forward, we can anticipate that the same way we anticipate our permitting fees and other revenue. Um, and then the other thing that is not popular with our community, but I think given the cuts that we've put on the table, is we may need to take a closer look at selling our assets. You know, we've talked about parking garages, but I don't know if we've really had a deep dive into what assets are worth selling. So those are my surface thoughts right now. Um, I'm going to give more thought over the weekend, and thank you very much for your presentation. You're welcome. And what I, what, what I will add is that we have to look systemically. Um, and one of the biggest challenges I've had in this position and, and, and every other person in my position across the world has the same problem, and that is uh, we want to address individual, say, individual racism. Um, if, we in, if we address individual racism, we will never move anywhere. I mean, I'll just be constantly putting out fires because there are racist everywhere. Let's just agree to that, right? And so um, the idea is to look at it systemically. So we, we have a system where racists don't want, individual racists don't want to and cannot e exist. Um, and so all of this, in the entirety of the budget for me is, is we've looked at slices of the pie. Um, and where, where are we looking systemically? I think that the budget team and your city manager certainly does that. But for us to globally look systemically so that we don't see one individual piece, but rather we see the whole, and then we can begin to dismantle those pieces is, is, is what an equity framework looks like for us. Thank you, Dr. Yep. Uh, Alderman Ruth Simmons. Thank you. Sorry. Um, and thank you for the presentation. Um, so I'm not, I'm not sure that there is a finding. You said that it's absolutely equitable. It's absolutely not equitable. Yep. Um, but one place I would like a little uh, a more expanded response is on the greatest impact is to the directors. No, the, the greatest impact obviously is to our community, to our residents, and that's isn't that who we're here to serve as our residents. So the greatest impact is to the residents. What I mean is, um, when we have to begin somewhere to to figure out who's going to be most negatively impacted. So when we put out the priority based um, budgeting survey, we just put it out there. Lots of concerns, but we put it out there. The results told us we're not hearing from our black and brown communities. Uh, and so we went to listen to the black and brown communities, and we got there, we realized we're still missing other populations. We, we're not hitting seniors adequately. So if you start at the director level uh, and, and understand how they will be most negatively impacted, and they can understand how their staff will be most negatively impacted, then they can reach further down in the community and say, is our assessment right? It appears to us that um, the closing of, of, of Fire Station 4 will, will certainly impact this community in a way uh, in, the, in the following way. Ways. Right now, what we're hearing is the closure is going to impact a lot of people, um, but we don't have any data to talk about who and how does it really affect the community. What 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 really will the numbers look like? Uh, what can we really anticipate from this? And so it's that data that that we're missing that a lot that that leaves you with what I've given you. Absolutely yes and absolutely no. There is not a definitive answer because we have not adequately defined what equity is. What's keeping us from that? Uh, so part of it, we should not be too hard on ourselves. We engage in this work. We decided to intentionally engage in this work of being equitable um, only a year and a half ago. Um, the reason that the city decided to do that was because they recognized that there were some inequities that they were dealing with and some problems and challenges. So now what we have to do, what, what's, what's preventing that is we just don't have the systems in place yet to do it. 
and, and I'm urging us, um, when we came before you, the, the commission came before you, uh, what we're urging you to do is adopt this system that we're putting in place. It will help us. It will show us where we're missing the data. Um, and so when you look at across the board how we collect data, we don't collect it consistently. Um, so, so in our boards and commissions, we now collect demographics. We, we haven't historically done that. Uh, in, in responding to the budget, we haven't adequately collected data historically in, certain, in particular ways. We haven't identified and recognized the data that we do need and then start putting that into place so that when we get to these places, by the time we get to the budget next year, if we follow our system, we will have that data because the commission will have identified those data points in, in conversation with the staff, and we will have that data, and we will then be able to say yes, that will really impact this population in a significant way. Okay. So the tool, is that tool going to be used by the directors? Could you tell us more about the tool sure. that we're missing? Sure. It's, a, it's an equity framework tool. It's seven steps. It's an it's actual document that you can sit down with and say, uh, okay, we're looking at uh, Harley Clark. And you put in a Harley Clark. All right, who's going to be no, most? Who's potentially going to be most negatively impacted by Harley Clark? Now, I have heard across the board, time and time again, um, that this is a plot um, to keep you know black people off of the beaches. That may or may not be true. So the first thing we need to do then is we need to talk to the to the to the African American the black community. <laughs> the second thing we need to do is talk to those who never use Harley Clark. I mean, so it, it gives us so now that community engagement piece is, is step number two. It's and it's community engagement in ways that we're not accustomed to doing community engagement, hence a tool. So when we looked at the budget and we recognized uh, we're missing black and brown population, the tool said go out, go to them, don't ask them to come here, go find them, document where you find them, how you found them, and how many of them you found, and what did they say. And then it asks you to bring that information back and put it in the packet. So even city council will get that packet and say here's how we engage the community. And the community in the, in, in the first step of the budget would be your directors. Here's how we engage them. Here's what they said. And here's how their, that input shaped our recommendation. So you'll have all of that before you, and you won't be scrambling for information. Now, don't get me wrong. It's not going to happen overnight, but that, that's the process. And then there's seven additional steps. And the last one is evaluation. So we get back here to the budget year, and we can see, did we accomplish what we said we were going to accomplish? And then based on that, we would leave budget, this, these, these, the, the, the proposed budget, or uh, the budget adoption would leave us with a set of equity goals for each department. And they would go about trying to now meet those equity goals going into the next year, starting with that process all over again. Thank you. So um, I, this is the first I'm learning that we didn't know what equity is. So I want to say what it is for me in my role as Fifth Ward Alderman, that it is the residents of the Fifth Ward and the neighbors and the community having the same quality of life as all of Evanston. And that means access to jobs, access to services, opportunity to own homes in Evanston. Um, so those are some priorities for me. So I would like to get that out there. I didn't know we were still trying to figure it out. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Marie Simmons. Alderman Braithwaite. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I guess, you know, what I hear is, is a consistent message that when we first started this, I was locked into individuals. So I was always thinking about the individuals who are being affected by our lack of services. And I think you said this earlier um, in your presentations that we need to evaluate how we are delivering our services to the community. So to your point, Alderman Simmons, um, how are we delivering our service to whether it's a Fifth Ward resident? I mean, I guess I would use black, white, whatever the case may be, because our services are so, so different. So I do understand how we need to look at the directors to get that type of input and engagement and, and data. So, I mean, if our services range from our vital, you know, from our safety, right? Mm -hmm. And then below that, I would say, you know, our vital interventions in terms of our mental health services and services provided by the health department, our job trainings provided by the parks and recs. And then we have things like arts. And so I, I don't have the necessary tools that I can rank these and what's important, but I like the fact that what you're asking is we need to have more data just to make sure that we're inclusive to all of them. And I yes. know the ones that are important to me and the residents that I serve, but I hear what you're saying. And absolutely, if you, the, the, the 
the, the district, school district 65 identified that their black and brown students across the board were lagging behind um, in their achievement. The achievement gap was much greater for them. As they began to dig into that, though, they recognized it is black and brown, but, but our greatest, most vulnerable population is the black population. And so we're going to hire, we're going we're gonna to deal specifically with the black students. And so they hired an executive director of black student success because the data showed them that, yes, we have two populations, black and brown. This one is really needs more triaging. Um, and so the, looking at it systemically and defining that, even narrowing, tightening up our, your, the city council goal of ensure equity in all operations will allow us to know we're not serving this community, but how are we not serving them? So we're, get, we're able to cover them here, but we're really not doing a good job here. And so here's where we need to invest more money this year, or more time and staff this year. Is, and so we, we just have to look at those systems that tell us specifically how to deal with those issues, as opposed to going, well, you know, it's, it's, it's the black and brown community, and so anything that comes up, we should give to the black and brown community. No, we, we want to be sure that we're, we're targeting it adequately. Yes, we do need, this is, a, and we have, and that's why we prioritize racial, um, race, racial equity, is because we have to recognize that that is by far the overarching community that's most deeply impacted, and we have to pay special attention to. It may, though, there may be an issue that comes up where we have cheese and we recognize, well, they don't need cheese. They've got plenty of cheese. So let's distribute the cheese in a different way. Thank, thank you. Alderman uh, Wynn? Uh, yes, thank you, Dr. Effie. I, I think um, Alderman Braithwaite and Alderman Simmons have, uh, Ruth Simmons have asked some of my questions. Um, so in terms of the collection of data, yes. um, a number of us sit on CDBG, and so when we, uh, when we are um, determining how to allocate our grant money, a lot of what we look at during that process is the data that yeah. the organizations present to us. So are we, and which is very, very helpful, because yep. otherwise I think we'd be lost. Mm -hmm. I mean, who, who, is, who deserves more? They all deserve <laughs> more than we have. So um, with respect to our, so our, our departments then, um, from what, what I'm hearing you're saying is are not tracking in the same way and, and may actually not provide direct services in the same way that you could measure. So I think each of our departments then are going to have to figure out what's the data that they could gather and how do they do that um, and so that they can um, figure out what are, where are their services going. Mm -hmm. or, and then I guess the question is how do they figure out what they're missing? Mm -hmm. That's part of it. So. Um, so is that, I, I just want to understand, if, okay. make sure I'm understanding. So when you say there is no data, yep. so when we, um, so when we look at vital services, uh, for instance, so we, we don't keep track of uh, who, co who needs, who, who comes in and gets um, uh, the documents that the vital services provides um, or, or what are the uses in the community? I mean, I I, I appreciate hearing uh, what the what the community has to say about that, but you're right. We can't just depend on anecdote and um, to make these decisions. So I think that's my question. Or so is, are these departments not able to keep track of what the services are that they provide? Okay. So let me let me go back and make this clear. First of all, our, our departments are doing. Outstanding well, no, I'm work. Not, I'm, not, we are all, yes. right. I'm just we, asking, yes. is that a new component that they have to add? Well, what's happened is, of course, each department is tracking their needs, their what their services are, who they serve, uh, how they serve them. They are tracking that. From a more global standpoint, as we're coming trying to put this equity lens on it, uh, I need broader data. I need to know how that data um, intersects with some data from another department. How, how have we um, mutually or collaboratively considered this to recognize, oh, we're, this is great data, but, but there's more that we need to glean out and tease out of this. So it's, it's, more, it's more someone standing back and taking a global look and saying, well, this is great for your department. You need this, you need this, you all got that, right? But what do we need to then come back to the council and give them big picture? Um, and so, yes, it's, uh, I mean, some of it we're just realizing. I mean, yeah, a lot of it we're just realizing, but a lot of it we're just realizing because we've just gotten into this work. Okay. So my last question, I think it's probably the hardest one because I have many more questions, is um, for this budget, yes. um, because this is, uh, and this is one of the most difficult I've ever had to consider and vote on, um, what 
is is there any data we can look at now for some of these things that would help us make these difficult decisions? You can, so let me tell you, yes, the data that has come out of each of the departments, um, there's, they're in the newspaper, they're the, the department directors in budget memos, I would, that's, that's the information that we have to work with. Um, and, and based on that information, that's all that we have, and we have to work with that. It's not bad data, so hear that. Um, it's not bad data, it's just globally not complete. But, but I would deeply encourage, as I was looking through all of those memos and doing my own research, I learned tons. It, it was only through that process that I learned that, uh, yes, if you cut the communicable di disease part, but you actually lose more people than you think. So the data, what we have there is, I would encourage you to, 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 to dig deeply into what's there. Um, but I also, and I, I'm going to say it anyway. I also consider the fact that that the budget team and the and, and the city manager uh, have made these recommendations because they have some information, more information than I do. Mm -hmm. And so, in part, I have to kind of look at what they've recommended simply because they're the ones that have the most. Um, wisdom expertise in, in this, you know, I can tell you broadly, if you look at the health department, I will tell you, if you ask me to make a recommendation, the health department should be the number one thing we consider. Because period, it cuts across everybody and everything. It's going, it, 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 it's going to affect us the most broadly. Um, but does it dig into issues of, of particular communities? Uh, well, and, and the health department does, but does that particularly deal with issues that we might need to consider in the future? I don't know, because there's just simply not there. Okay, thank you. And the city manager, do you have anything to add to that? I, I, I do. Um, I cannot tell you how my city manager heart is just uh, jumping for joy to hear the city council of Evanston, Illinois, talk about data. Um, we, we came to you uh, a month or two ago, uh, Ms. Ms. Leonard, the community development director, uh, sort of talking about these frameworks with the STAR community program. Um, love the STAR communities, don't love STAR communities. That's the kind of framework we need. What are we here? What is the business of the community? Um, Johanna, the STAR uh, <coughs> evaluations, 400, 600 data points? 400 data points. So we have been collecting for the last four years 400 pieces of data that help us understand how we deliver services for the STAR community program. And so that's a pretty broad area. Equity and empowerment is one of the, the nine areas of the STAR community program. So we have that data uh, in your budget and the budget every year. Uh, Kate, how many uh, performance measures are there? 50 to 100, which when I got here were more like four or 500. Um, you know, the, the, the performance data that we have in the budget perhaps is not as meaningful as it once was for a, a different view of the, of the community. But we still have it and we still collect it. So we have that data. We have the STAR Communities data. We are now going to have this equity framework to apply. I mean, it, it's the larger now question. There's no shortage of data, I think. Right. It's a matter of what's the most important right. data, how, what kind of lens do you want to see the data through, and then ultimately, how does data drive drive the accomplishment of the city's goals? How does data drive, again, the big picture versus what happens here and in city council chambers around America? One person comes with one particular issue that's worth $25,000. How does that then solve your budget? And so if the council is willing, once we move through this budget process, to have more serious discussions on how we use data uh, to accomplish the broad goals of a municipal government, um, well, I won't say everything falls into place, but I think the, the pieces start to come together. Um, and I think it has been um, the difficulty, again, of communities all over America of dealing with what's in front of you directly versus that larger picture of what we want to be as a community. Um, so the pieces are there. You have very talented staff. Uh, Pat and I did not talk about this presentation. I basically told her, say what you want. Um, so this observation about the departments is a really fascinating one. Your department directors, they run the railroad 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They have to deal with the delivery of services every day and quite honestly don't always have the luxury to take that step back because they are busy delivering those services to the best of their ability, that the fire department is, is, is as you heard earlier, doing what they need to do, police all the way down the line. Um, 
they don't have that luxury. And so when we all go to them, Pat and I and, and Johanna go and say, there's the bigger picture, they, of course, never disagree. They simply ask, well, when do we spend the time? How do we, what resources do we allocate that we don't currently allocate to be more mindful about these measures? And so if the city council through this process says, yes, we need to do better, we need to do more. We're prepared to do better and more. There are time and resource issues to do that, but we're going to continue to have budget challenges. And if we're clear as a community, these are our priorities, it will make things easier and we'll be able to point to what are we trying to accomplish in very specific terms. So. We're committed as a staff, again, once the dust settles here, um, to really engage you to whatever level the, the city council wishes to be engaged. Great. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Alderman Rainey, and then we got Alderman Ruth Simmons. Sorry. Sorry. No, no, I'm fine. Have you, have you looked at the way we're going to raise the revenue we're going to raise through the equity lens? And by that I mean the council made a decision not to raise the property tax. So instead, what we're doing is we're, some people call it nickel and diming. I'm thinking it's more like dollar, dollar. <laughs> um, have you given any thought to which is more equitable, the raising the property tax or raising fees and fines and uh, services rendered by the city, which is what we're doing? I have, um, and I, I will say that Wally is absolutely right, and I want to tell you how much that's appreciated, and that is that uh, he has had zero input into what I have found. He has given me free reign and said, you know, short of calling me out of my name, you tell them what you need to tell them. I have looked very much at that. My concern uh, is by, for example, with the, with the proposed cuts to the health department. Uh, what we don't recognize is that if that goes through as proposed, uh, then we're going to have to pay Cook County some money, which is going to cause a fee for some residents. And that, that's a fee that we have not been clear or transparent about, perhaps because we ourselves did not know that. Uh, and when you look at uh, sending services, doing victims advocate services through the Y, that's a cut and that will save us some money, uh, but then how does that get uh, into the hands? How does that benefit the residents? I, I think you're better, and I need police chief anything to walk me out after I say this, but I, honestly, I think it, the, the overall raising the tax is, is a much more equitable way to handle that and then to figure out how to help residents um, deal with that raise. Um, but in terms, of our, in, in terms of this community, the reality is, as I understand it, there is a significant deficit. We have to cover that deficit, uh, and, and it seems to be that this broad, uh, let's raise this and then move on and figure out how to go on from this, is the most equitable way, because right now the way it's going to turn out if, with the proposed budget, we're just not going to know the, the impact on residents. And, and so they're going to be greatly, more greatly impacted than, we anticip than they anticipate, and probably than we anticipate. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to explore that a little more. I mean, if we increase, the, if the council decides in, to increase the city property tax, the people that are going to be most impacted by that are going to be lower income residents. Whether you're a renter, your rent's going to go up, or if you happen to own, your property tax is going to go up. We hear a lot from people about how unaffordable Evanston is. We hear a lot from all of us about how much we love this community because of the diversity in this community, socioeconomically, racially, ethnically. Um, we know in general uh, that race and socioeconomics runs along the same line so. here in Evanston. And so, you know, it, it, looking at fees versus looking at a property tax increase, if you look at fees, I think some people think, well, okay, you know, take parking, for instance. If parking rates, you know, went up, but the city used this uh, approach that they presented to the council about, um, I forget the term that you called it, Wally, uh, the demand-based, demand-based, where you still can get parking for the current for the current rate. You've got to park in the garage, you know, and, and if you're parking at the parking meter, you're paying sort of a premium, so to speak. 
you know the thought the thought is at least in my in my mind is that better than a property tax increase because you the individual and the resident have more control over you know this than if it were just an increase in property tax where you don't mm -hmm. and so one of the things, part of the issue here is, again, is that, that we haven't defined what we want to be, who we want to be, and how we want to respond to be an equitable community. Um, the insure equity in all operations does not help at all. I mean, it's, it's so nebulous that we could go any direction anywhere with that. Um, so, but what I would say to you is that this really, this co these kinds of conversations, uh, equity conversations and conversations about an equitable community really push us to, to, to make some decisions. So the affordable housing. That, when you talk about raising taxes, affordable housing becomes an even bigger question, right? Um, and, and, and what are we going to do about affordable housing? How, how are, what, do, what is affordable? How can we define affordable um, for those on the lower end of the socioeconomic scale? How do, we de how do we address those issues? And that's part of it is we keep kind of work, working in this more global way. And, and again, yes, it's, on one hand it'll do this, and on the other hand it'll do that. We have to, at some point, make the decision and then determine, okay, here are the consequences to that decision, here, here are the remedies for that decision, and, and let's go. Um, but, but we are making, we do make lots of assumptions, and, and in general, those assumptions will pan out even with your data. Uh, when, when, when we say that, you know, parking revenues, you know, people can choose to park or not, we're assuming that a, a, there's a certain socioeconomic group that really does only use that parking, but we don't have the data to support that. And again, I, right up front, probably is true, but, but what does the data tell us? And, and, and how are we engaging with the community? All right, we've raised taxes and this is what it means. Now we have to be committed to going in and help mitigating the consequences of those higher taxes. So we've raised the taxes, we've got this. Now what our job is the next six months is to pay attention to the communities that have most, most been impacted by this and figure out how do we assist them how do we allow them to continue to live in our community? And then it hopefully forces us to take a really hard look and recognize there are unintended consequences to everything we do. And this, this budget, that's just the way it's going to be, no matter how much that makes all, any of us uncomfortable. So, so but, but a commitment to mitigating those consequences okay. and moving forward in a way that allows us not to come back to this place next year or in five years from now is what's most important. No, thank you. Um, Alderman Fisk and then Alderman Braithwaite. Um, I love this. I, I love what you're saying. Um, it's it's an, an interesting way of, of thinking about every decision we make and how we're going to have to be making that decision in a slightly different way. It, it, everything becomes a little bit more complicated, but in some ways it becomes clearer. So... Um, I'm more than willing to do that. I think that's a great thing for our city. Um, you're taking some of these issues that I had sort of thought I had fixed in my brain and you're turning them upside down. And I'm like, wow, you know, I mean, but that's interesting. It's interesting to, to go through that um, and, and not only challenge, but discussion. <laughs> Um, I, I sort of equate it to going on a diet and counting calories. You, you know how many calories you're going to spend during the day. You've got to make a choice. What are you going to eat? And it becomes suddenly, wow, thank, you know, my day's just gotten much more complicated, yeah. but in a good way. So I, I, I want to find a way that we can have this discussion so that our brains are sort of around it in everything that we do, in every committee we're meeting in, and every, um, I almost want to wear a button on my shirt that reminds me to do that. Is that the right way of thinking about this? I mean, we're, it, oh, thank you, Alderman Holmes. I knew Alderman Holmes would tell me what the right thing was to do. <laughs> um, but I, I, I really want to do that. So. Where can we where can we start training ourselves? I mean, should we come to human services? Should we? Because of this, it can't be just that we sit down and talk about this today or talk about it, you know, once a month. We've got to figure out how to do this and everything that we do. 
How do we do that? Wally and I have been talking about that, and we, we do have a plan. So after the first day, once we get through the budget season, we have a plan to kind of get city council all on one page uh, and then understand how you can embed this in everything that you do. Um, and it's, 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 it's much easier than you think it is. Um, it's just it's, it's coming to this place where we make that commitment. Um, and I think coming to this place uh, in the midst of um, a crisis, a budget crisis, is a very good thing because all of us are uncomfortable. None of us want to be back here. And so it pushes us um, to do the work coming up um, beyond this. We've got to get through this because the reality is we can't fix this in any way. Um, but once we get beyond this, let's be serious about, like you said, embedding that conversation in everything we do. Great. Th thank you. Alderman Braithwaite. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I that I heard from Alderman Fiskin. I don't know if you've had an opportunity to go to their one of their meetings. Really impressive. Oh, I'm sure you have. Yeah, it's, I mean, they get very granular in mm -hmm. the conversations they have and how they break it down. So I would encourage members of council, if you had not an opportunity to do so, please, please attend. Um, I've had an opportunity, and, and City Manager, thank you for talking about the Stark communities, just to briefly look at their website and their framework. Um, I'd like to make a referral, I don't know if now is the appropriate time or maybe we do it at Calls Awards to, to look at this. I like the idea of having a metric and uh, some type of measurement tool. I just want to make sure that this is, this is the right one. Just looking at their goals and objectives, I do see the equity and power piece embedded yep. in all the areas that they examine yep. and love to have that broader discussion in human services. Uh, to make sure that we're using the right one. I've, we've had a conversation years ago uh, that I wish we could find a similar tool to measure uh, how well we provide service to the black community. And we just, for whatever reason, we've never been able to find that. But maybe with looking at this group and with Pastor Effiam, uh, we can find something out there. I mean, that is an uh, interest that I take very seriously. And I feel that if we are able to look at the black community as an example, because there are others that need the same measurements, I'm yep. saying as an example, yep. that we, that's how we change the scope of Evanston. Yeah, and, and if I may, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, Alderman Braithwaite, we have to take the STAR community framework and really make it our own. And I think part of that then got doubles back to, to Dr. Effium's point. Um, we collect data, but we don't necessarily have enough of it. I mean, we collect all the STAR community data, but we don't know who we're serving. We know we're serving people. And then the STAR community framework really is it doesn't go that granular. It just says, are you serving your community in X, Y, Z? It doesn't say who in your community you're serving and then conversely who maybe you're not serving. Right. So there's likely a way that we can continue using the STAR community because the, the questions are the right questions. Mm -hmm. We just have to do a better job having more complete answers. Mm -hmm. And so if we have more complete answers and know which communities within our community, again, this is a national framework. Sure. It's meant to be uh, something that, that I think is at a community basis, but really we want more out of it. We want it to be much more granular, uh, and I have to think that we can, we're asking the right questions, we yeah. just have to get more detailed answers. Yeah. So if I could just follow up with a question, because I feel some of this, and I know our directors participate in Cradle to Career, I mean, I feel like they are in the process of gathering some of this data. And if not, I'm, I'm, I guess it's just the question, yeah. are they doing it? And if not, why? And how do we engage them? Because I wouldn't expect for our city staff that participate in Cradle to Career to have to go out and recreate the same work or the same framework or ask the same questions that I hope they're asking within the time that they spend. They are asking and they are collecting, um, and, and it does help us and we do benefit from it. More than that, it, it's really about us determining what, 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 what data do we specifically, I, I think the data exists in many senses. Really? We just haven't determined how we need to centralize that and where it needs to be, so how, where do we need to capture that specifically? Equity goals would help us specifically capture that when we have this goal and we know what, what am I looking for, I will have an equity goal in front of me and so I already know this is the data I'm going to need to answer this question at the end of the year. So part of it is just making sure our system is up and running um, so that, that as we enter into the work of the framework, um, we have positioned ourselves to access that data. 
Great. Thank, thank you, Dr. Thank FEM. You. Um, okay, I see no more lights on that. Is there a second topic within yes, uh, and, SP6? And, and I'm just going to say thank you to Ms. Lewis Lakin for the excellent work that she's done, and I'm just going to direct you to the memorandum uh, that she prepared. Uh, the Balancing Act uh, uh, software exercise, uh, 199 balanced budget submissions. So that you, you had to do this, you had to balance. Uh, you can read for yourself. Uh, there was a demographic break breakdown. I think we did a, had a better job of getting a, a, a better. Uh, uh, cross-section kudos to the ninth ward 18 percent of of those respondents were from the ninth ward uh, when you look at uh, the, the, the responses people uh, were resoundingly didn't want to raise any revenue um, and uh, they weren't really keen on uh, any reductions to expenditures however uh, if you look at page six of the memorandum uh, the issue of across the board cuts um, and so the uh, uh, not surprisingly, um, the administrative side of the city, uh, everyone balanced their budgets by cutting the administrative side of the city. So um, so I, I, I point you to all that. Uh, as you know, uh, I conducted um, 11 uh, community budget meetings uh, throughout the community, and there's a summary of some of the comments uh, there. Um, and so I would have you look at those. I think uh, um, it's safe to say that the fire station was the number one uh, point of discussion at all of those meetings. Um, I think that there was a, a struggle uh, regarding capital spending um, and, and really very little um, in suggestions on uh, other uh, approaches. Um, but I will leave you for all that. And then there were comments submitted through the website, which we provided to you uh, verbatim, and those are the last several pages of this. So uh, I, I think just sort of to conclude, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, uh, the, the, the city's staff's presentation with the budget, um, we worked really hard, I think, to engage people. I, I was really surprised at the interest in these community budget workshops. I think as uh, uh, Dr. Affiam said, you know, we, we have to get to people more. I mean, and that takes time, energy, and effort. Um, but I think people enjoyed it. I think people enjoyed uh, being in diverse places from Little Beans to uh, Temperance Brewery uh, and everywhere in between. Um, and I think we just have to institutionalize those kind of discussions more often. I think the, the ward meetings certainly do that to a certain degree, but I also think that there's a structured framework uh, to ward meetings um, that sometimes, uh, just by the nature of the beast, uh, you know, don't allow the same kind of discussion. So um, we provide all that information for you. You have a, a number of budget memos. Um, uh, and at this point, Mr. Mayor, we'll, we'll just get out of the way and be happy to answer any questions as the council deliberates over any time remaining today uh, and then the next several Mondays. Okay. I, I just want to commend you and Kate. I read through that last night. It was, I, I think you guys have really done a remarkable job this budget season getting, getting out there and the tool. I mean, so many people came up to us to tell us, you know, how difficult your job is, right? Because you got the tool and you got to balance it at the end of the day. So well done, well done. Alderman Fisk. Yeah, sorry, this is just a really basic question. Um, Wally, can you tell me why the Ecology Center budget is up? Uh, on page 104, uh, Parks and Rec of, uh, of the, the uh, uh, proposed budget. I, I, it does, is there something included in there that hasn't been in previous years? Yes. Um, I, yes. I don't know. Uh, yes. Ms. Luce Lincoln, do you want to come to the podium? Uh, the Parks and Recreation Department had another bu business unit that was the Echo Quest Camp, uh, and they have moved that into the Ecology Center. So those were previously two business units have been combined to one. So it's not an increase, it's just a transfer it's of just, something over yeah, from one okay. part of the budget. You should see that business unit showing zero okay. for 2018. Oh, okay, I see. I see the Echo Quest camp. Okay. And what is an Echo Quest camp? For, <clears throat> well, just for those who might not know. 
It's uh, a great camp. Good, af- good afternoon, uh, members of council. <laughs> Lawrence Hemingway, director of Parks and Rec. It, it is what we've done is just to show the Echo Quest camp is ran by the Ecology Center staff. Mm-hmm. And for clarity purposes, we wanted to show Echo Quest has its own business unit, but it's ran by the Ecology Center staff. So, you know, it's part of what they do. So it was, in my opinion, to show the combination of the t- of the operations so that you see, because that revenue still um, balances the, the actual uh, program right. or the expenses of EcoQuest. So that's why it's combined okay. as opposed to broken out separately. Okay, I got it. Thank you. Are, are those the uh, camps that are down at the fog houses? What's at the fog Yes. Houses? Yeah, okay. That, absolutely. Great. Thank you. Okay. Any more? Any more discussion on questions or things with the uh, SP six? Okay. See, seeing no lights, um, we're going to move to uh, call of the wards. Before we do that, I just want the uh, the public to know uh, on Monday evening. Um, it, October 29th. Uh, Wally, correct me, but we're going to be talking about the budget as well as affordable as well as affordable housing. This is a meeting that we set up for affordable housing, um, and uh, and there'll be a lot of conversation at that meeting. Uh, I anticipate about the bu- about the budget. Um, what I would ask um, the public: we certainly, as always, will have public comment. Um, <laughs> We have had public comment, obviously, at the last several meetings. Many people have gotten up about the budget. You're certainly welcome to get up about about the budget. Again, the last meeting we had, we had about 50 people. I would ask this. If you have gotten up and sort of expressed your, uh, your opinion, uh, there may be some value on Monday night if we don't have a huge line for public comment and it gives this council more time to have a really thorough conversation about these really challenging issues. I think between the you know public comment that we've had, between all the community workshops that we've had out there, the tool uh, that has been used, this council has a tremendous amount of information. They understand the difficult decisions that have to be made. Um, so that would just be my, but be my request. If you've been up and sort of said your piece about the things that concern you most, it has been heard by every everybody up here, and I would love to see a, a really uh, vibrant conversation up here uh, about the budget on Monday night. Uh, Alderman Rainey? I'm, I'm sorry. I thought we were going to go into something else, not in the meeting, so I didn't have my light on. Um, I would like a, a brief explanation of how the determination was made to not have a certified not um, to cut items in the budget that would disqualify us from being a certified health um, agency. Alderman Rainey, members of the council, uh, I know that uh, Director uh, Thomas Smith had a funeral that she was going to and I think stayed as long as she could and still not miss that. So let me let me take a crack at that and yeah. we can, um, and Ms. Dorley has been spending a lot of time uh, tr- sort of parsing through uh, <laughs> definitions uh, and funding sources with, with the health department. Uh, we are a certified health department under the state of Illinois uh, through the planning process that we do annually or every five years, uh, which is known as the E-Plan. And I think you've heard the, the, there have been presentations on that in the past. So the certification of, of the being in the health department comes uh, from that planning process. So. Um, we, we could continue to do the planning process uh, with the cuts. Um, however, um, there then comes another definition which we have never really talked about specifically here, and that is the definition of a health department <coughs> under uh, the, uh, uh, the the terms of the state of Illinois. Um, and so in dealing with the budget process and looking at potential cuts, uh, we focus solely on those cuts that were not supported by revenue, um, um, and were funded through the general fund. And so the, the, the cuts that you have seen uh, reflect that. Uh, in further discussions, and I'll ask Ms. Storley to come up because 
my ability to do this off the top of my head is going to come to an end. Um, the, the the issues with being a health department under the state of Illinois, uh, one uh, component that if we do not keep it, we will not be a health department is the is the communicable disease uh, <laughs> uh, service. So we, we don't have to have a position per se, but we have to continue to provide those services to be considered a health department under the definitions of the state of Illinois. Is that correct? That is correct. But in my discussions with the director, um, sorry, good morning, members of the council, Mr. Mayor. Uh, she has stated that uh, that position, those are basically full-time responsibilities that couldn't be uh, given to other staff. So so in the, in the creation of the uh, budget uh, uh, recommendations, uh, th that, that piece, even though it's, there's a, still a large general fund portion to it, um, uh, was included for that reason. Uh, through these discussions, uh, certainly from my perspective, I would, would hope that the council would consider restoring that position because we need to continue to have a health department. Obviously, there's lots of other things the health department does which are not being proposed for elimination. So people have I've been very uh, loose in their discussions about this. There, we're, we have never at any point proposed to discontinue the health department. Um, but by having the communicable disease position restored and uh, Director Thomas Smith is coming back. I don't know if she heard us speaking or if someone, re or, or uh, Alderman Holmes is always the alderman. She called her. Uh, um, I love Evanston. Um, so, so uh, Alderman Are we glad to see you? So. <laughs> So, so the rest, the restoration of the communicable disease position will allow us to continue to be a health department. We're, we were, Director Thomas, with I'm so sorry. Um, we are. Uh, we're talking about. I'm out of breath. Sorry. Nice to see you. And, I, and, I, and the council knows you need to be someplace else. So we will. Uh, we can probably continue this discussion on Monday. Uh, we've been talking about the differences between being a health department in Illinois sure. versus a certified health department in Illinois. The communicable disease position will allow us to continue to be a health department in Illinois. Uh, the certification comes from the broader uh, e-planning process uh, that we do every five years. And so That's I've good. just shared with the council that uh, it would be my recommendation that we restore the communicable disease position uh, in order to do that and I think then the council would probably want a broader discussion about the other services that are being proposed for reduction um, uh, the, the the public health educator the assistant director um, and then the shift to um, the, the the victim advocate so perhaps uh, mr. mayor members of the council we'd be happy to start Monday evening discussion with it with a broader description of that we've also looked at some of the revenue numbers uh, and have I think submitted a message Memo in the packet from yesterday, uh, with a with a better um, focus on that because some of the grant money that we receive is multi-year, so we want to make sure that we're counting it fiscal year by fiscal year. And I believe over the last day or two, we've done a, a, a more precise job with that. So, Alderman Rainey, is it all right if we then continue this discussion on Monday so that we can let Director Thomas Smith okay. head out? Thank you. <laughs> I have one more question. One more question. Yes, um, I I want to better understand the whole movement of our uh, parking enforcement operation to a private entity. I, I I don't quite. I'm looking at the numbers, and you're telling us that our parking enforcement officers total eleven nine full time, two part time. And they only do parking enforcement 70% of their time because otherwise they're doing other services such as crossing guards, et cetera. And I, I'm not confident I understand how that change is going to work. And I have a very, very strong belief that our parking enforcement department needs to be increased which in turn would generate more revenue because a lot, and I'm, I'm not talking about going downtown and ticketing shoppers from out of town because they didn't put enough money in the meter. I'm talking about defending our residents who have asked for things such as um, EVS districts where on weekends, 
the neighborhoods are filled with cars from Chicago at my end of town. And there's nobody, to, you, you can't get anybody to come and ticket them because on Sunday I think there's one part-time person working. Some, I mean, and God knows where they are. You can't expect them to perform a part-time person, one person covering the city. So anyway, I, 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 I just don't understand how this is going to work. Alderman Rainey, first of all, I think you were talking about contracting out the crossing guard services. We're not planning on contracting out the parking we're enforcement okay. services. All right. I, I oh. made a mistake with that. All right. So how, how – but in the, in the parking enforcement off, uh, department, it shows an increase, I think, of 200000 How are you going to do that? So what we've shown in the uh, budget balancing worksheet is that if the city council agrees to move forward with uh, the services of the crossing guard being provided by an outside agency, that we would then free up those crossing guards that are currently covering for sick calls and things like that uh, to actually go out and enforce. So some, like, like you said, 70% of the time they're doing enforcement, 30% of the time they're doing uh, traffic for police, and then they're doing crossing guard services. So if... 15 to 25 percent more of their time was freed up to actually do enforcement, then we anticipate an increased revenue to the city of about $200,000. As you I'm talked to, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but I wanted to get to the point about uh, the, what your, your, point is, is on Sundays we have, very, we have one person, if we're lucky, uh, covering a four-hour shift on a Sunday. So we cannot cover the EVS districts and things like that. Uh, we did not ask for an additional PEO in the budget this year because we will get some additional revenue if those uh, crossing guard services are uh, contracted out uh, by utilizing the existing crossing guards in a different way. However, as we've spoken before, uh, every additional parking enforcement officer that we have in the budget is a net impact of about $225,000. After we pay them their salary uh, and take that out of the revenue that we would gain from uh, their services being provided, it's a net $225,000 if you would I would, get. I would like a budget memo on adding two parking enforcement officers. I could do that for you. Thank you. The, and the impact it would have on revenue and expenses. Sure. And, and Alderman Rainey, if I could just clarify, with your idea of, of having a, a more even uh, enforcement schedule through seven days? Yes. Okay. Yes. And, and another problem is evenings. Evenings, it's terrible. I mean, we need, because the EVS districts are evenings. That, that's when enforcement is required. So. So, that, so that's important information for us to respond to because um, there already are shift workers. I think I, if we are able to, if that's what the, 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 the intent is, we can then perhaps look at shifting full-time positions um, to a, a Tuesday through Sunday, Wednesday through Sunday, um, you know, you know mid-afternoon mid to, you know, mid-evening shift. So if that's, there, there's an interest there, we'll, we'll work on that because I think that would also um, be helpful. I, I yeah. think enforcement on weekends and evenings is just as important as during the day. So I don't know how you how you plan for that. But right, well, the, the current staffing model has nine full time positions and two part time. So we tried to give ourselves a little flexibility with those two part time people. Um, but again, things like uh, the football game today, yeah. none of the parking enforcement officers are actually out there. <laughs> They're helping with traffic enforcement and with parking enforcement around the game, right. but not in the rest of the city. I see a suggestion coming from the city council later. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, seeing, seeing, seeing no more lights, thank we're going to move to uh, the, thank you, uh, Ms. Storley, and thank you, Alderman um, Rainey. Uh, we're going to move to call the wards. Uh, Alderman Braithwaite. Uh, I made my comments earlier, but I, I am interested in making that referral to be able to examine the Star Community at our next Human Services meeting. Uh, or whenever, whatever future. Yeah, I, I, mean, Alderman Ray, I, I, I don't know the, the we would be able to. Um, whenever. We'll, we'll, we'll try. I would, after, have we, to, I would after. Yeah. Budget's easy. That's, that's, do that? Yeah. That's, okay, yeah, that's, let's do that. All right, Alderman Wynn. No. Alderman Wilson. I just want to thank all the people who actually stayed and listened to the conversation. I'm very grateful for that. Yeah. Indeed. Uh, Mayor, Mayor. Yes, Alderman Wynn. I, I'm sorry, I forgot. Um, I wanted to thank everyone who came out to the town hall, third ward town hall meeting last Thursday. And uh, I will be at my office hours at Brothers K this coming Thursday morning, 7 a.m. to 10 a.m. So uh, come and let's have a conversation. Thank you. Thank you. 
You're good. Uh, Alderman Ruth Simmons? No report. Alderman Suffernan? No report. Alderman Ravel? No report. Alderman Rainey? No report. Alderman Fisk? Um, thanks. I, I wanted to thank Alderman Wilson for his comments earlier and for his comments just now about people staying. Um, we hear all the time about lagging trust in uh, city government. And I think when you stay and you listen to the conversation, you understand um, the, the depth that we go to to try not only to communicate but also to get our heads around the budget and do the right thing for Evanston. Um, you, you can't do that unless you really sit through it with us. So I'm I'm really happy to see you all here. Again, thank you, Alderman Wilson, for that. Now, on the comment that um, Alderman Rainey was just making, I'm, I'm curious as to, is, is there any way to estimate the lost revenue from um, parking enforcement during football games? Uh, you don't have to get up. I'm just, I'm just, I'd like to know if there's if there's an estimate of how much money we're losing. Thanks. Terrific. Thank, thank you. Uh, is there a motion to adjourn? Second. I guess there's, was there a second? Second. Okay. All, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? All right. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everyone, for coming out and participating today.